Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the forum today. I'm Tom Dawson, and I'm Comcare's Director for South Australia and Northern Territory, and I'll be your Master of Ceremony for today's event. That title sounds rather grandiose, however, in practical terms, I'm just the timekeeper. <clears throat> Excuse me. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are all virtually meeting today. I'm speaking from Adelaide, so I'd like to acknowledge the Ghana people, the traditional custodians of this land, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge the contribution they make to this nation, and I extend that respect to all Indigenous Australians and Torres Strait Islander people who are present. In addition, I also acknowledge the cultures of everyone in the Comcare community and the richness that these cultures bring to the work that we do. Wherever you are this morning and whatever you are doing, welcome. Please feel free to let us know in the chat function what lands you are dialing in from today. Start off with a bit of housekeeping. And speaking of the chat function, we also welcome and encourage you to engage and share your thoughts, questions, and generally interact with each other in the chat function. Time permitting, there may be opportunities for you to ask questions of some of the speakers. And please feel free to respond and contribute to any questions asked by other participants. The sharing of knowledge and information is the key to this event. You can access the chat function by clicking the icon with the speech bubble on your toolbar. We also ask that comments in the chat remain respectful and relevant to the topic. We're also recording the session today. However, only myself, our speakers and the slides that will be on screen will be recorded. Looking ahead, we are planning to publish some of the sessions, resources and guidance that are spoken to today on the Transport Network Forum page. I'll talk further about this and what's next at the end of the forum. OK, so I think that's it for housekeeping at this stage. It's time to open up the forum. To start off, I'd like to pay my respect to all of you that work in the transport and logis logistic industry and to welcome everyone to the reinvigorated Transport Network Forum. Time flies and it's been a tumultuous couple of years since June 2019 when Comcare last hosted a transport forum. The forums were initially designed to address key risks with the within the transport organisations under Comcare's jurisdiction. Recognising that these risks were not confined to Comcare's jurisdiction, there was support to open the forum up to the wider transport industry group. So it's encouraging to see a number of participants today from organisations broader than those solely within Comcare's jurisdiction. One of the strengths of these events lies in organisations themselves wanting to share their innovations in regard to how they manage common work and health, health and safety risks. It's a credit to the organisations involved that are willing to openly discuss their learnings, what worked and what didn't work, putting aside any competitive advantage. And we thank you for that. Personally, I've been, in Com I've been working for Comcare in the regulatory space for quite some time, specifically across the SANT region. There are a significant number of organisations that are participating today, have depots, warehouses or workshops, etc. Over time, I've had the opportunity to meet and work with the number of you that are present today. That's given me appreciation of some of the challenges faced by the industry, and I'm privileged to be involved in today's forum. The advent of COVID-19 interrupted this program of work and gave Comcare the opportunity to fine tune our technology capabilities, which has allowed this forum to reach a broader audience and with a greater ability for audience participation. At our last forum held in June 2019, we had approximately 30 attendees in a face-to-face -face format. When we last checked, we had over 100 registrations with representatives from the Commonwealth, self-insured licensees, other regulators, universities, and health and safety professionals today. In putting together this forum, Comcares have relied on the experience and knowledge of a number of transport industry organizations, and we would like to thank them for their support and contribution. Specifically, KNS Freighters, Lynn Fox Australia, Ron Finneymore, Australia Post and DHL Supply Chain. Going forward, Comcare intends to facilitate a transport network forum twice a year, ideally May and September. We'll be inviting the transport industry to share their data, insights and openly discuss challenges to, to manage industry specific risks and hazards and to raise awareness of initiatives to help manage and prevent injury to workers within the transport sector. We have a great program today with a diverse range of speakers. We really do hope you enjoy it. So let's kick things off and get this truck out of the depot and onto the road. 
sorry about that pun, try and keep them to a minimum. I'll now hand over to Justin Napier, who will do the Comcare welcome. Justin joined Comcare in June 2015 and has oversight of Comcare's regulatory operations group. This includes the inspectorate functions, regulatory policy, audits, authorizations, intelligence, and education. Over to you, Justin. Yeah, thank you, Tom, and uh, for your introduction and welcome to everyone today. I'm speaking to you from Perth today and would like to acknowledge the Wajak uh, people, part of the Noongar people, the traditional custodians of the land, pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Let me start by thanking everyone for supporting this Transport Network Forum through your attendance today. Excited about today's program and the key messages we would like everyone to take home. I would firstly like to recognise the work done by this industry, supporting Australian communities through the past three years of crisis. It's been a difficult time for everyone, but for the transport and logistic industry, the challenges have been extreme. Your response to this crisis has been phenomenal. Australian communities have continued to survive, recover and thrive because your industry has been able to deliver goods and services through bushfires, floods and a pandemic. I think it's important that we recognise and acknowledge the essential work your industry does. It's never been more important than the last three years. I'd just like to show a, a short 30 second clip from Healthy Heads in Trucks and Sheds. I'm showing this video because it highlights the complex and critical role played by the transport industry in Australia, providing us with essential goods and services and, need I say, toilet paper. So I'll let the video roll. There's no dialogue through it, so don't be alarmed. Okay, well that, uh, I think, very quickly highlighted some of the uh, some of the activities that happened in getting parcels to the door. Um, uh, so while Comcare is thrilled to facilitate this forum and bring together those in the transport and logistics industry, I want to stress this is an industry-led forum with a WHS focus. So to get the best value out of these forums, your participation and engagement is essential. As an industry, you are best placed to understand and respond to the health and safety issues that are evident in your workplaces. So today's forum is part of Comcare performing its role under the, under the WHS Act, which includes promoting and coordinating the sharing of information, fostering cooperative and consultative relationships, collecting, analysing and publishing statistics that relate to WHS, and providing information and advice on WHS to duty holders under the Act. Road transport makes up 16% of the Comcare jurisdiction, a large proportion being our licensees. It's a significant industry in the Comcare WHS jurisdiction. We do welcome all within the transport and logistics sector, as well as those with an interest in this area. So we're pleased today to be able to provide this channel, this forum, as a way for you to share knowledge and uh, hear from a broad range of presenters and their different perspectives. Our past experience with this forum has been very positive. The contribution from industry has been invaluable. But I do, as Tom said at the outset, thank you for putting aside any commercial differences and approaching this as a means to share insight and knowledge with the aim of bettering health and safety across the sector. So the working group has identified the management of psychosocial risk as a priority for the transport industry. So let me give you a, a quick update on jurisdiction-wide matters that I think may be of interest to you. As I hope you are aware, the review of the model WHS laws is underway. The recommendation from this review is to broaden the notification provisions to ensure psychosocial incidents are being reported. Safe Work Australia are progressing amendments to the WHS Act that will better capture psychosocial risks. We expect to have a clearer picture as to what this might mean later this year. A code of practice for psychosocial injuries is nearly finalised and was endorsed by Safe Work Australia members in December last year. 
For this to become an enforceable model code of practice, it must be agreed to by all WHS ministers. We anticipate this meeting of ministers will happen later this year, and assuming all ministers agree, the code will take effect thereafter. So Comcare will be keeping you updated as this progresses. And noting the anticipated legislative changes arising from the model laws review, and importantly, those relating to the regulation of psychosocial risk, Comcare has established a psychosocial risk regulation team. Later in this forum, you'll hear from Andrew Waits, who is our assistant director leading this team. This team will work initially with the jurisdiction to educate, advise and raise awareness of psychosocial risks while preparing for the implementation of the codes of practice and changes to the WHS regulations. Notwithstanding this work, Comcare will continue to monitor compliance with psychosocial concerns that come to our attention and where necessary undertake inspections and or investigations into these matters. We are finalising our psychosocial risk regulation approach and the aims of the program will be to firstly understand psychosocial hazards and risk management maturity in the Comcare jurisdiction. We want to improve compliance through the provision of advice and guidance that prepares individual PCBUs and the jurisdiction for the implementation of the model code of practice. We want to enable and assist duty holders to achieve evidence-based management of psychosocial hazards and risks, including by aligning mental health programs with identified risks. We want to support and build the capability of the inspectorate, the Comcare inspectorate, to regulate psychosocial risks across the jurisdiction and will develop an evidence base to inform priority areas for improvement, training and resources across the jurisdiction. Management of psychosocial risk is incredibly important for all PCBUs and our psychosocial risk regulation team will be reaching out to employers in the coming months. We will also continue to enhance the education and training materials that we have available to assist you in identifying and managing risks in your workplace. In closing, I'd like again just to thank you for your participation today. I do sincerely want to acknowledge the critical role your industry has played during the unprecedented times we've been living through. I hope that you find today's forum interesting and enlightening and you take away knowledge and information that improves health and safety in your jurisdiction. So I'll hand back to Tom now to introduce you to our next session and presenters. Thank you, Justin. In the next session, we want to hear from you, the participants. We'll be using the Mentimeter tool. And if you haven't heard it before, have heard of it before or used it before, it is simple. You can do this on your computer or your phone. Jump on to menti.com. That's M-E-N-T-I dot com. M-E-N-T-I dot com. And enter the code on the screen now. I'll hand over to Bev and Shane, who will talk you through the activity. Over to you, Bev. Good morning, everyone. My name's Bev Smith. I'm the Senior Director National Operations at Comcare, and I'm joining you from the Ghana, from the lands of the Ghana people. Uh, hi, Bev, and uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, my name is Shane Albury, and I, I'm Assistant Director with Comcare, and uh, I'm joining you from the lands of the Gadigal people. Um, back to you, Bev. Thanks, Shane. So we're here to talk through the Mentimeter activity. After this forum, we'll take time to consolidate this feedback and share themes with the working group. Hopefully you'll find the session to be of benefit to you and an opportunity to share your views and hear from your peers. Participation in the survey is voluntary and responses are anonymous. However, responses to questions will be displayed, so please don't provide any information that may identify yourself or other people. We're not intending to collect any personal information from you um, through the survey responses. And if you'd like further information on that, Comcare's privacy statement is in the chat. So we'll move to the first question. Um, okay, so we've consulted with the industry for this forum. However, we'd like to get some feedback from you to give to the speakers, to give them a good understanding of what you're hoping to get out of today so they can emphasise areas of particular interest. So if you could start um, we can see some responses starting to come through. Didn't take long, Bev. <laughs> no, that's great. Fantastic. So understanding of the impact of psychosocial factors in the industry. 
and we've actually got some presentations on that. Information about safety in the transport sector. Um, the good, good one there about insights and viewpoints. Yes, so we've got some a, a good representation of people, particularly the panel from the the from the transport sector coming up. So um, we'll get some real insights from people actually working in the industry as well as those outside the industry. Better understanding, read the value of this forum. Some great questions coming. Yep, priority focus areas. Update on work Comcare is working on. So there is uh, an update from Comcare regarding, uh, particularly in relation to um, uh, fatalities and and the work SWAS doing in that in that space. There's a good to one there. Further. Yes, Jane. Sorry, Beth. There's a good one there about more understanding of safety within transport itself as well, and to address the psychosocial risks. Great. Understanding what psychosocial risk factors are. Yep, there's a there's a session on that. It's something actually we'll be covering in this Menti forum as well. So um, just having a look at other things, information about hazard and risk and what is being done about those. Yeah, really important. Um, we've got some really good speakers coming to talk to you about about what what's what's happening, um, both external and within the within the trucking industry. Important one there, Bev, about the role of the WHS regulator as well, and uh, seeing there's so many regulators in this space. Yep, true, Shane. So we'll move on to question two now. So that, that's been some really good insights um, for our presenters. Um, so the next question is for those working with within the industry, which best describes your usual workplace? So we've got a lot, office and admin. We've got three there. So I'm still waiting for responses to coming. Other, do we have any drivers in the audience? No, we don't we've have got, any drivers. <laughs> so if we've got any drivers out there, hop on your phones. You, 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 you're you lagging behind here. <laughs> um, we've got warehousing and logistics. Okay, so. We have a lot of others. We do have a lot of others. OK, so. Um, so we've actually got quite a lot of people working from home too. Mm. So if we're looking at that, we've got. We've got what? Got 28, 32, 33 responses there, so. I think um, looking at that, oh no, we've got a driver that's coming. Good. It's good to have um, some representation from drivers here as well who are out there, um, you know, providing this, you know, essential service to the community. So we move Along. on to question three now. So the next two questions are in relation to your working environment and if there's been a change in work health and safety risk profile as a result of the crisis over the last three years. Um, the transport and logistics industry is one of the highest risk industries for work related injury and disease in Australia. According to Monash University's driving health report, the industry has a rate of work related fatality nearly five years the national average of other industries. So here we've included the key causes of harm from the driving health report. We'd like to know, and you're already coming up, which ones concern you, and, and we want to know what's changed over the last three years. So this question is actually asking you to think back three years ago and what the risks were three years ago, and the next question will look to determine if those risks have changed. And we can see, looking at this question, body stressing, if we're looking at three years ago, body stressing was the key risk, and then we're looking at fatigue, vehicle incidents, so mental stress. It'll be interesting to see if mental stress changes from three years ago until, you know, when we look at what the current situation is and what the risk factors are now. Being hit by moving objects, so I'm assuming that's in the warehousing, um, warehousing um, working environment falls trips and slips so look that's uh, a really good response there from everybody um, so we might move to question four now and I'll hand over to Shane and we're going to be looking at now at the, the risk in the current environment and comparing to what 
we had three years ago to see if there's any change. Yeah, thanks very much for that, Bev. Uh, in the previous question, we asked for your opinion on pre-COVID. Uh, we'd like to hear about what you think the current challenges and risks are now. So in your opinion, or recently, rank these WHS risks in order of uh, prevalence. Um, all workers in the industry are subject to uh, a unique set of health risks in their workplaces, uh, especially in warehousing, uh, workshops, you know, truck driving. That may include a lot of sitting, uh, long hours, sometimes in isolation, changing shift work, poor sleep patterns that may compound fatigue, among others, uh, all of which uh, some of most or, or of you may have experienced over the past three years, given rise to new and emerging safety issues. And it, from the answers or from the responses, you can see that there is a, uh, a massive change in, um, in, in the answers there with uh, body stressing slowly slipping down to third, mental stress uh, hitting the top mark there. Fatigue, uh, which we, we mentioned earlier, is uh, still sitting up there very high. Um, vehicle incidents coming in there and forth. So it's, it's extremely relevant to um, the changing in uh, the last, uh, you know, two, two or three years. Yeah, it's it's it, it, it's really obvious, isn't it? With mental stress sitting there up, right up there in first place, um, and fatigue sitting in second place. I mean, body stressing is still there, very strong, but um, clearly, you know, the crises of the last three years, um, those risks have definitely become more prevalent. So we'll move on to the next question. Um, so many of you have indicated mental stress as a prevalent risk in the last two questions, so we'd like to delve into that a little bit further. So the draft model code of practice um, and the uh, the international um, standard on occupational health and safety management of psych risks have um, come up, have, have identified about 18 uh, hazards that lead to work health and safety risks. So over the next three slides, we will share, and we've categorised those risks for ease, we'll, we'll share those categories and ask you to, to select in your opinion what psychosocial risks are present in your workplace. So looking at it, um, we've got uh, job demands. So when we're talking about job demands, we're talking about the emotional and the physical and the mental um, stresses of the job. Uh, we've got uh, role expectations. So again, that's around where there's not clear expectations, um, where um, where you might not have clear procedures or you're not clear about what the priorities are. Um, job security is a big one there. Um, and, you know, people obviously in the current economic environment, people are probably very concerned about their job security. Mm -hmm job controls right up there. So that's really how much control you have about how you actually do your work. Um, and remote isolated work is up there. And, and that's not surprising given that we do have some drivers in the audience and, you know, they, they're travelling long distances to places where they have access to limited resources and communication. So, and working environment, again, um, you know, a lot of this industry works uh, in in environments, in in factory and 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 in vehicles, and so that's not surprising. But really, the big one up there is job demands, and that's probably reflective of what's been going on in the last three years and the expectations of um of of being able to service the community through these particularly difficult times. And 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 Justin was acknowledging that and the, the, the thanks of the community um, for, for that work and the demands that have been placed on the industry. So we might move to the next question. The next category is, um, is in relation to the management of work. So if we're looking there, we're looking at, you know, uh, leadership. So, you know, uh, in terms of leadership, uh, whether workers are you know, supported um, and whether, you know, leaders are, are, are modelling the values you would expect in a psychologically safe organisation. Change management is a, is a big one, particularly if you're going through massive transition and, and workers need to be supported through that. Supportive management is another big one. Reward and recognition, you know, if, if people, you know, getting feedback, getting access to 
positive feedback and also um, recognition being proportionate to the effort that's being put in. Organisational justice is another one. If you're not aware of what that is, it is around um, it's around where you know there's unfairness or bias in in decisions. So decisions you don't perceive them to be fair, or the application of procedures or um, or activities or, or resources is is not fairly distributed. So um, so what we're seeing here is change management is a huge one here. Now this is probably again reflective of the last three years where you know the industries had to ma adapt massively in regards to supply chains and what's been going on with COVID and, and had to be really flexible because of you know the resourcing constraints that COVID's brought into place with you know workers with quarantine, shutdowns, lockdowns. Um, all of the border closures. So it's it's it, 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 it change management is really reflecting that 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 environment that we've been through in the last three years. Uh, so if we look at support is is another factor that's right up there and leadership's a big factor that's up there. Um, and then if we move down to organizational justice, and um, so I, I think those results really reflect what's been going on in the industry in the last the last three years. All right, we might move to the last question on this one, um, which is what psychosocial risks are present in your workplace relating to social factors at work. And what we're talking about here is culture. So in terms of culture, you know, is the culture get things done at any cost? That's, that's, you know, when we're talking about negative cultures, that's the sort of cultures we're talking about. Um, relationships and interactions. So, you know, work environments where there's poor relationships, where, there, where there's conflict, um, uh, where you're likely to see more, more psychological risks. Violence and aggression, obviously that's self-evident. Sexual harassment is becoming a really a key uh, issue in workplaces um, as as we're becoming more transparent about those risks and and bullying and harassment, which you know we're we're all aware of, and and clearly in stressful work environments or environments where there's a lot of pressure, uh, you know those that that contributes to to those risks further. So, um, looking at this, we're seeing culture as as a big risk factor relating to social factors at work, relationships and interactions, and then bullying harassment. So that's some really interesting insights into it. And it probably reflects the high pressure that that your workplaces have been under in the last um, in the last couple of years. Um, the panel um, that we've got at the end of the session, we'll be talking about lived experiences through that period and, and we'll, we'll get an opportunity to sort of unpack some of these issues um, further as um, throughout the sessions. So again, we'll um, move on to the next uh, question and I'll hand back over to Shane. Yeah, thanks Bev. Um, next question is, can you tell us how confident you are in addressing the psych psychosocial risks so it ranges from being uh, confident, neutral, not confident, or unsure. Um, yep, it's up there now. <laughs> so I'll just say that again. How confident are you in addressing psychosocial risks? Uh, it should be um, it's either you're, you're either confident on, on how it's being dealt with or yeah, it's neutral, not being uh, dealt with um, in, in any fashion, or you're not confident that has been dealt with. I'm so not sure waiting. what's happened with that question. Well, we're waiting for the results to come through. There's probably a bit of a, uh, a time okay. lag, Shane. So it's time to do a little tap dance here, don't you? Uh, we're waiting okay. for the questions to come through. <laughs> I'm sure we're able to do that, Bev. <laughs> but I've got to, no, I've got to say, going, going back in your previous uh, questions, you know, it, it really does highlight, um, you know, the, the increase pressures or um, oh, stresses go. that people are after. Are you here? Exactly. Yeah. So are we seeing the, oh yeah, we've got the responses coming through now. Coming so through? look, yes. Yeah, ah, there, there we go. Uh, not confident. That's um, yeah, surprising there. And a few unsure. 
couple in the, sitting in the neutral, but and I mean it's it's a good level of being confident as well. So I mean I don't think it's a, a, a bad result from that point, even though not confident is gaining ground. Well, I, which is I, not I think good. I think not confident is probably reflective that, you know, we're still learning a lot about psychosocial risks and, you know, how to best manage them and what controls are best. And and also, you know, those psychosocial risks have really become prevalent in the last three years, you know, with 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 what everybody's been through with some. Um, with, you know, the COVID and the lockdowns and the stresses on industry. So it's not surprising that people aren't confident because while, while these risks have been around for a while, you know, we're still waiting on clear guidance through the the, the model code of practice and, and through work health and safety regs. So um, I think that's probably, um, you know, a, 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 a appropriate or, or a real response. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for that, Bev. I'll move on to the next question now. Uh, what would what would help to support you and your health in the future to manage psychosocial risks? Uh, from uh, it, it can be through organisational levels up to industry wide initiatives. I mean, we've already seen some uh, industry wide initiatives out there uh, from uh, us providing or others providing uh, a high level of uh, information or some information. Uh, we're looking at uh, maybe technologies. Um, there is a, a gamut of, of areas that we could look at, you know, different types of programs, internal, uh, industry-wide uh, training in, in some aspects, um, but there must be a, a, a lot more out there that, uh, we, uh, we, that we still don't know, you know, and able then to maybe look into as, as we, as we move, move ahead. So we're seeing a lot of um, responses in terms of more guidance and training, more educational materials, guidance, leadership training. So there's a lot around guidance and leadership mm. um, and better understanding of what's out there to to address those risks. Yes, yeah, so and see, uh, yeah, a lot in leadership, a lot in training. Um, so. I think we'll probably leave that question. We'll move to question eight if uh, if it's available. So question eight, for those working in the industry, what are some physical manual handling tasks that are required within your role? Um, from this question, uh, it's very traditional, very, very traditional. And, uh, but there, I think there's a lot of new emerging risks that are coming out of it as well. So, uh, data tells us uh, that body stress is the most prevalent mechanism of injury across all industries, not just uh, transport and logistics. For those of you working in the transport and logistics industry, um, if you're able to tell us in one or two words, what are some of the, the physical man manual uh, activities that you believe contribute to injuries in your in your work? There's a lot coming up there at the moment, carrying, lifting, sitting, hand loading, uh, moving awkward loads. Um, this is multiple question. You add, add as many uh, uh, questions to this as, or answers to this as, as you like as well. Um, there's also uh, people may want to look at uh, some of the new stresses sort of from reaching um, and changing uh, work habits uh, that we may have as well. Those so sitting, lifting, carrying still, still seems to be the uh, the most traditional there, uh, repetitive tasks, uh, MSD management, um, carrying loads over 25 kilograms. Um, uh, yeah, I think we've uh, we've hit most of majority of the traditional ones there, plus a few uh, new ones I haven't seen before. So, in this question, how confident are you in? in effectively addressing body stressing risks in your workplace. So we headed off there, pretty good uh, uh, starting point. We've been very confident or confident in that area. Um, Which is interesting. It's a change to psychosocial risks where, you know, there wasn't that level of confidence. And so, you know, it's mm. good to see that, you know, um, there is that level of confidence in relation to body stressing risks. Yeah, I think because it's been around a while, they're, 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 yeah. the industry has put a lot of work into it over the past. But saying that, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, uh, it's still prevalent and we're still getting a lot of uh, uh, body stressing injuries. So yeah. 
that's so, me. Bev, back to you. So look, what I'd say is from the preceding questions, we can see that body stressing risks are well known and people are actually confident in, in how they're addressing it um, or, or feel confidence in how they're addressing it. And we know the transport and logistics industry have been addressing them through engineering, admin controls and through behavioural change and use of technology. Even so, even through, even though there is that confidence there, the data shows us that instances of injury and incidents as a result of body stressing are still the highest mechanism of injury in, in injury in the industry. So, I, I, this question asks you to share the types of initiatives that you your you've got in your industry with with others as part of the forum. So, if we look at that. Um, and I know that um, we'll be talking about some of these initiatives later on in the forum, but um, if we look at some of those initiatives, body pre-start program, training, be upstanding program, safe spine, load restraint, um, training, are you okay, pre-start stretching. So it sounds like there are, are, are quite a few initiatives going on, and I've I've been privy to some of those from the previous forums that we've had. So, and I know there's been a lot of work going on in this space. So the Well Check program, watching CCTV, asking employees, including employees, on. I can't see the bottom of that one. So, uh, champions in the workplace. Just on the one there with load restraint, um, uh, that one uh, I had uh, some uh, privilege to to attend. Not wasn't that long ago, and uh, and found it very very valuable in that space, uh, especially the changing met methods of um, how you uh, you pull down loads and and things like that. So that was great. So we've had a look at what you've done. So is there anything um, that this question asked you if there's anything that could be done to manage physical in your physical health in your work or what more can be done to manage physical health in your work so if you'd just like to to put anything up any ideas that you have about about what you think more could be done to to try and uh, reduce the incidence of body stressing in, in injuries we'd be really interested to hear um you know is it further information we've seen that a lot of trainings going on a lot of focus about um, you know, pre-start workouts and things like that. So um, we're waiting for any results to come up. So safety two, okay. So safety two principles. Um, for those, um, safety two is is really um, looking at um, working with workers to understand the work and. Um, and taking it from a very much worker centric perspective. So that's um, and I and I think you know the industry is is starting to look at those safety two principles. So that's really interesting. And I think in the panel we might have some discussion about that. Um, There's a great one there, Bev. I ask a worker what they want to help them. Yeah. Sometimes you know it gets a bit lost. Yeah, so that's linked to those safety two principles, I think. Engagement of health professionals to assess tasks. I'm aware that some um, industry does do that. Um, some of the industries have, have done that. They've got exercise physiologists in and things like that to, to assess how people are actually carrying out their manual handling tasks. Equipment design, yeah, engineering solutions are a big one, um, particularly when you're lifting heavy loads. Review uh, of old thought processes. <laughs> I do like that one. <laughs> okay, and so look, the last question is really looking to the future and and what do you foresee to be the biggest challenges for the transport industry in the future? Um, this can be anything from an organisational level up to industry wide challenges in in in, you, in your industry. So, what what do you from your those of you who are working in this industry, where where do you see those challenges are? Look, we've just been through huge challenges like COVID. Nobody would have ever predicted that. So, worker retention, yeah. Look, I think we're all aware of the aging uh, aging workforce, particularly yeah. in the drivers, mental health. Shortage of workers. Yes, we're already experiencing that at the moment. Aging workforce, industry attraction, so attracting people to the industry, <clears throat> keeping the knowledge in the industry, getting away from a blame culture to a learning culture. So that goes to those cultural risk factors. 
um, driver shortages and staff shortages. Yes, so we're definitely seeing that through COVID and um, and you know in those additional stresses that are putting things on. Continuing rapid growth in freight tasks. You know we're all we're all getting used to online shopping. I think COVID's given us a step change in that. I never used to shop online, and I shop online all the time now. So I think you know a lot of those challenges um, really helpful to have those um, articulated. Um, so continuing keeping the knowledge in the industry. Yep, that's a big challenge, um, particularly with the ageing population. How do you succession plan for that, particularly if you're having difficulty attracting people? So look, we're just we're running a little bit over, so we might wrap up there. Um, so that's Some great the answers. Yeah, they are great answers. So that's all the questions we have time for today. I'd like to say a big thank you to you all for taking the time to provide such thoughtful and honest contributions. It's extremely valuable to our work to hear from you, and I'm sure the upcoming presenters appreciate your insights so they can tailor their presentations accordingly. I hope I hope you gained a different pr perspective from from what you what you've seen today and some fresh ideas about what you might be able to do in your your um your industry and, and your business. So Tom, um, I'll hand back over to you. Thank you, Bev and Shane, and all of you have participated and shared your thoughts and insights in that session. Um, as Bev said, we're running running a little bit, a couple of minutes over, but um, if any of you, just a reminder, if anyone's having any IT or technology issues, we are relying a lot here on, on technology. Uh, first bit of advice would be to, to log off and log back on. I think I've got, I've got four, uh, four um, mediums open here on my screen, and for me, with the, my technology, technology uh, challenges that's uh, you know fingers crossed it all goes well um, right so our next session will focus on data and background in the transport and logistics industry delivering this session we'll have Dean Kyle Dean's a senior inspector in Comcare's Victoria Tasmania team and he's based in Launceston Dean's previous occupation was a, as a principal inspector with work health and safety Queensland based in Townsville with 10 years in the transport network group Dean will be joined by Associate Professor Ross Isles and Associate Professor Sharon Newnham from Monash University. Over to you, Dean. Yeah, thanks for that, Tom. Um, I'm broadcasting to you all from uh, Launceston, Tasmania, the original down under, I've been told, but most importantly, the land of the Palawa, representing Tasmania's First Nations people. I welcome you all today. As uh, Tom has said, I've always had a passion about health and safety and overall well-being of workers within the transport industry. I like working closely with the managers, the safety representatives, and all levels of the workforce to help build a relationship that focuses on safety management, management and ways to improve the various hazards and hazards and risks that are commonplace in the transport and logistic area. I'd like to try and give confidence to the industry and demonstrate that the regulator is always there to assist them in the capacity of achieving better workplace health and safety goals and continue working with industry towards zero harm in the workplace get into the uh, today's presentation. Now, body stressing continues to be a focus on ComCare as it is persistent prevalence as a lead mechanism of injury across the industries. About 42% of the claims received by ComCare uh, arisen from body stressing injuries, primarily affecting the shoulders, the lower backs and the knees. This highlights the need for continued education and targeted interventions across the jurisdiction supporting all the workers in the transport industry continues to do uh, address these risks as it is prevalent. Within the transport industry, body stressing injuries are primarily caused by manual handling tasks like lifting, pushing or pulling objects. This could include tasks such as stacking boxes, loading trucks and pushing pallet jacks. From the answers that we received in the Mentimeter activity you've just participated in that resonate with you and the manual listing tasks that you do within your roles. Our intelligence reflects only a fraction of the entire transport industry. That is why we're excited to have uh, Ross Isles and Sharon Newman uh, here today from Monash University to speak about the research they have conducted and how it has spanned over the wider industry for the last three years. Just a little bit of information about our guest speakers that are joining us today. Uh, Ross is an associate professor in the uh, deputy director of the Insurance Work and Health 
group at Monash University. He's trained as a physiotherapist and his uh, research focuses on the prevention of unnecessary work disability. That is when people are ill or injured and unable to work. He's leading the Driving Health Study, a collaboration between Monash University, Lynn Fox, the Transport Workers Union and the New South Wales Centre for Work, Health and Safety, which is uh, co-funded by the National Health and Medical Research Council. Sharon, Sharon is an Associate Professor uh, is of the uh, System Safety Team at the Monash University Accident Research Centre. Sharon has published widely in the area of workplace safety from a systems thinking perspective and has applied this knowledge to improve safety across industries, including transportation and healthcare. Okay, so we acknowledge we only have about a limited amount of time of the session of trying to catch up here. So uh, we'll be touching on the key findings of your receipt uh, research. So uh, let's uh, get straight into it, shall we? Now this uh, question is for you, Ross. Um, are you able to provide us a brief overview of the driving health research framework? And how did you use that data that you've collected? Um, sure, thanks, Dean. Um, I'll, I'll, um, I'll focus on trying not to be too technical. If if you people do want to see all the, the, the details of the things that we've done, uh, please go to drivinghealth.net. You can download all our reports. But what we know about health is health is really complicated. Uh, lots of factors can influence your health. So what we did in driving health was we gathered lots of information from drivers, but we put them into, into different areas, different domains. So one of those was the occupational domain, which is you know, about how the job is done, whether you're a long haul driver or a short haul driver, even how you get paid. Um, so we, we gathered those things uh, in one domain and um, we had multiple of those domains. So we had a personal domain. So about the driver themselves, their age, you know, are they, do they have a partner, do they have kids? Uh, we talked about the workplace environment in terms of some of the risks that we've talked about, the, the body stressing that they might need, that they do and how frequently they do that at work. We asked also about, you know, things about their lifestyle, um, you know, how much exercise do they get, what's their diet like, um, and their current health uh, at the moment. You know, if they're carrying a bit more weight than, than they would normally or if they um, uh, uh, have some chronic health conditions. And what we were able to do with the analysis is we, we collect information, lots of information across all of those things, but with the analysis you can actually work out, well, which things from each of those domains are actually most important in influencing, um, in, a, in our case, psychological health, physical health, but then also some work performance um, outcomes as well. And basically what we found was there are important things in each one of those domains that actually influence health. And that means that there's no simple fix. You, you can't just stop the body stressing at work if you don't affect, if you don't actually impact some of those other factors as well. So complex problems need complex solutions. So we need everyone on board to actually reduce, uh, to, if we want to improve health, we need a, a whole of system approach. And I'm sure Sharon will agree with me on that on that front. So I have to agree with that too. That's uh, It's important that you get that input as much as you can to sort of uh, drill it down to better solutions. Yes. Okay. We'll continue on. So, um, the transport and logistic industry is understood to be one of the highest risk industries in Australia. So how does getting the job uh, done affect the workers' health, Ross? I'd probably answer this sort of two ways, Dean. So uh, I guess the, the first way comes directly um, from the results that we found. Um, we found that working longer hours had an, a negative impact on all the outcomes. Um, so drivers who worked longer hours were more likely to have higher levels of psychological distress they were likely to have poorer general health, um, a lower general quality of life, and they also reported near misses, which isn't surprising. If you're on the road more often, you're more likely to have near misses. But what what that means is getting the job done means you just put in the hours. You know, you, you, if it's got to be done, you, you, you work what – you do what you got to do. Um, and the problem that our research showed is that actually is having a, a clear negative impact on the health of drivers. Um, the second way that I'd answer that would be um, is almost putting my physiotherapy hat on, uh, which is, you know, you, you put your head down, you get the job done. That means like your, things like your own health tend to be, um, you know, left to being least important. You know, getting the job done is more important than that, that niggle in your shoulder or that pain in your back or, or you know, what the, um, you know, that, that feeling that you're not quite right. Um, and so, you know, it also means there's less time to get those things checked out. Um, and 
when you actually finally do get something checked out, it's actually progressed a long way down the track. And so rather than, you know, that that shoulder being something that you could actually um, work with your physio or your doctor to to keep you at work while managing your shoulder and keeping it fit and healthy and what you need to do, it's got to the point where you need to take time off work because the only thing that's going to help it or get it to a point where you can keep going is a bit of rest. Yep. So that, you know, getting the job done, A, we know it has a negative impact on health, but it also means you've probably got less time to actually address your health and get on top of things early. I think I think you're right because you know the preventative measures are sometimes ignored in in the in the face of getting the job done and and uh, you know uh, trying to just uh, tough it out. So yes, you're correct there, mate. Can understand that. Another question for you, Ross. Um, so what does uh, the driving health research tell us about how unique workers and unique workplaces interact, resulting in different health outcomes? Can you explain a bit about that? Yeah, and th there's no doubt that you know driving as a profession you know it, it's there's a, a huge spectrum of the, of the different jobs that that uh, that drivers need to do you know whether it's the type of cargo they're carrying you know livestock versus grain um you know the different vehicles that you're in the, the type of driving that you need to do into the roads that you're on whether you're city driving or um, you know highway driving you know working for a small operator versus a big operator and every every loading location has different its own procedures etc it does make it really hard to drill down into the detail in some areas. But we did find some key differences between the type of work drivers do and the impact on their health. We actually found that short haul drivers, uh, and for us that meant those who were doing less than 500 Ks in a shift, they were more likely to report higher levels of psychological distress. So that means, you know, that um, the more time they're spending in traffic around other motorists is that it, motorists is actually increasing, you know, having a negative impact on their mental health. Um, and drivers told us in our in, in interviews that sometimes being out in the open road was the chance for them to actually, you know, um, refocus and and remember the things they really enjoy about their job when you're out on the open road. It's pretty hard to do that when you're, you know, in the midst of suburbia, piloting a large vehicle with, you know, people driving cars around you who think your, you, you know, you, your vehicle operates the same way theirs does. Um, but on the other hand, we found that long haul drivers were actually more likely to report higher levels of pain. So there's, you know, there's pluses and minuses to, to each. But what, what that does tell us is that when we actually are thinking about, well, what can we do to help drivers, that perhaps we need to help different sets of drivers differently. So if you know someone who's on the, you know, on the road um, around traffic, then they're going to probably going to need more um, more help with the, some of those, those psychosocial risks and 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 um, some conversations to actually let them debrief a little bit. Whereas those drivers who are a, a longer, um, you know, doing the longer stretches, probably need to be encouraged to get those niggles um, seen to, not just to go on to the next job to actually get something done in between. You know, that's a challenge when you're when you're all over the country. So not a one modern size fits all type of uh, approach there. I can understand that. OK, we'll keep continuing on there. I'll just put my regulatory um, hat on for a sec. There you go. <clears throat> and just ask you about training. A lot of people dismiss this at, at a low level control, but does that actually have an effect on the driver, Ross? Well, well with your regulator hat on, I think this, this will make you happy because we, we actually, <laughs> we asked drivers about how much training they'd had across the, you know, the different areas, whether it be a, you know, a site induction all the way to, you know, dealing with hazardous substances, et cetera. And we found that um, drivers with higher levels of training, they actually reported lower levels of psychological distress, so they were less stressed at work, um, and they actually they had a, a, a higher self-rated ability to do their job. So the levels of training and OHS training were actually quite positive across the board, and in fact, it was one of the few things that actually showed positivity across most of our outcomes, which I know I, I found surprising, but it's encouraging. So the actual, um, you know, providing training to drivers, you know, it 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 helps their mental health, but it also helps them get the job done, which which we know is 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 you know is is cru crucially important. And I guess it, it it gives them confidence that the the employer has uh, uh, met its obligations and and they feel that they are a cared uh, valued employee at the end of the day too. So yeah, I, I, I can understand that. I get that it can be a hassle at times, you know, when you when you're just trying to get yep. something done. And you, and, but it but it is yep. important long term, and, yep. and you're right. It's about mm -hmm. looking after the drivers. That's right. 
Okay, that's another question for you, Ross. Um, the transport industry is known for its long working hours, social isolation and high job demands. Now, Ross, your research has highlighted that truck driving is the most common male occupation in Australia with an estimated one in every 33 male workers being a professional truck driver. This is a huge proportion of our population. Now, we've covered off on some of the external factors that can contribute to the health of these workers, but what did your interviews with the drivers uncover about their own health and wellbeing? Well, I knew this question was coming, Dean. So we've got a there's a a video that uh, hopefully we played in the background in a moment. But we we actually spoke to drivers and their family members um, to tell us a bit more about the why um, it was uh, with some of the things that we found. And we talked with drivers and we went through what they told us line by line. And they told us there were seven key factors that impacted their health. And they <laughs> the wheels moving at the moment, so it's a little hard to see, but. Those seven key factors were related to physical health, mental health, relationships, work conditions, regulations, um, physical health is on that wheel twice, um, and attitudes. So one of the things that um, that we found through our analysis was that these things need to be in balance. And if all of those things are balanced, it's like you, it's it's like the the wheel is set up to 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 run properly, to run smoothly. Whereas if if you don't have balance across those things, so if your mental health is low, for example, if you're struggling or or um, you know there's some of the relationships outside of work aren't so great, you end up with uh, effectively a flat tire, uh, and and we know you know you, you're not going to be driving for long on a flat tire. You know you can get away with it, um, but long term it's going to lead to excess wear and tear, and you know potentially lead to um, terrible consequences. So. When we spoke to the drivers, when we sort of really looked at what they were telling us, these were the these were the seven things that need to be balanced. And for us, it 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 fitted being a, a wheel. Um, and one um, one aspect is that some of these things can be addressed with a conversation. That they don't necessarily need, um, you know, uh, a huge input to have an impact to actually, you know, pump up someone's tires. You know, it's, um, that's what we talk about. <laughs> you, you pump up someone's tires. It's exactly like that. And if you actually give someone mm -hmm. the opportunity to improve aspects of their mental health or the relationships or, or the conditions at work, it is like pumping up their tires so it can it can run smoothly. And that's what mm -hmm. that's what the drivers and their family members told us when we really looked closely at what they were saying. Oh, that's good. Thank you for that. Uh... Uh, Ross. Now, Sharon, I know you've been sitting there quite patiently uh, and uh, you've heard the old saying, there's no such thing as a free lunch. So we're <laughs> going to pass the baton over to you. You need to work for it. Fantastic. Okay, Sharon, no worries, no pressure. <laughs> now, um, Sharon, it dri the drivers deal with so much that's outside of their control on a daily basis. You know, for example, uh, uh, high value loads, other drivers have to share the road with maintenance of the truck, complying with laws and regulations, not to mention the social isolation they endure. How do we manage the health of our industry when uh, there are so many other factors outside of the control of these workers? Could you explain? Yeah, it, it definitely comes down to looking at the, the safety, health and well-being of drivers from a systems thinking perspective. So if you think about the, the road transport system, we're not talking only about the equipment, the vehicles, the drivers themselves, other road users, but we're talking about management, we're talking about regulators and we're talking about government bodies too. So each of these actors within the system play a key role in influencing the safety, health and well-being of drivers. So it's not possible just to look, well, to optimise safety, health and well-being. It's not possible just to look at the drivers and to provide intervention for them alone. There needs to be so many different uh, interventions across the system. And as Ross was saying, it's about targeting those interventions aligning those with the roles and responsibilities of key actors across the system, not only looking at the drivers themselves. So it really is a shared responsibility. Thank you for that. Oh, OK, um, now Sharon, you can uh, can you just let us know like where the interventions are required in the system and how do we get the right people involved? Well, again, it's looking at now how do we actually focus intervention and it, following on from the uh, driving health study, it's very much targeting what those key issues are. 
And I think it's it's great to be able to look at those key issues and what they mean for drivers. But it's not only taking that perspective of how can we actually apply these interventions to be able to support the safety, health and well-being of drivers themselves. That in itself is a very much of a reductionist view to safety. It's about elevating that type of finding and that recommendation and saying, well, what can employers do to support drivers in ensuring those interventions are, are feasible and practicable for use? And again, and how can regulators and government bodies support employees in providing that guidance material on how to effectively implement it and even support around resourcing in the implementation as well. So it's about looking at, again, from that, that systems thinking perspective and looking at interventions, not in isolation of the system, but at looking at the roles and responsibilities of all actors across the system and how they can support the implementation of those interventions. Understood. Um, apologies there. I did bunny hop, so we have to go back. Stupid mouse, it's broken. Anyway, um, <laughs> Sarah, I'm sorry. Um, Ross had spoken about the driver uh, well-being wheel, um, identifies areas that need to be balanced for driver well-being. We know that the uh, data tells us in the in the terms of uh, causal risk factors. So how can we start to use this to develop the uh, targeted interventions where driver health is central to the outcome? It's about having starting those conversations. So it's looking at those findings and and saying, well, what does this mean in terms of interventions for drivers, um, interventions for employees, interventions for regulators and government bodies? So it's about again elevating that. But the first of the first thing we need to understand is that the the evidence from research provides only one piece of the puzzle. We need to ensure that any intervention is is feasible and practicable to be implemented within industry. Unless interventions resonate with any level of the system, including drivers, employers, regulators, and they're able to actually implement these interventions in a feasible and practical way, the best evidence-based intervention is not going to be effective. So it's essentially, it's a really big piece of the puzzle in terms of implementing interventions is having those consultations across the system. And the system's thinking, it, it, it resonates with that because what, what systems thinking is about really is to improve that consultation across the system and to ensure that that consultation leads to review and revision of risk controls. And until that those, those systems are put in place effectively to ensure that we know that that things are well, the monitoring of any type of intervention, um, the outcomes of those interventions, and that evaluation framework will, overall it is actually guiding that 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 whole process. We won't be able to improve that consultation. Um, so essentially, the the question the the answer to that question is we need to actually have those conversations. Uh, need to yeah. have that evidence base to inform those conversations too. Yeah, it's an imp a very important process of uh, uh, safety management system. So if you do know what you put in is effective, otherwise it may need tweaking. It may need a, a, a whole different approach. If I yep. can understand that. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so we've got a question for both of you, um, Ross and Sharon. So have you spoken about the uh, importance of finding the balance to achieve health and safety uh, and uh, health and wellbeing? And Sharon, you're informed of the benefits of the system-based approach where the onus of changes is not just on the worker and their health, uh, it's focal to the outcome. Uh, so we're going to wrap up this, this, this uh, session by discussing some possible solutions and a way forward for the industry, as well as areas of focus for future intervention programs. And um, how do we go about getting the industry to buy into this? Uh, any thoughts from the pair, from you both? Oh, you're on mute, Ross. Uh, you you got muted off first, so you go. <laughs> yeah, well, just following on from the previous question, I, I think it's yeah. about using the evidence base. I think the driving health study is the is a fantastic evidence base to to start this journey. I think the next stage is being able to go out and and provide do the consultations with those key stakeholders in the systems to identify whether the recommendations that have um, emerged from the driving health study 
are feasible and practical for use within the industry itself. Mm. So until that those conversations are happening, we don't have that really critical piece of the puzzle. And that is, is are these evidence-based recommendations feasible and practical for implementation? Yeah, I'd, I'd follow on from, from that, Dean, by, by saying that um, one of the things that we've tested in driving health is um, uh, interventions that don't just focus on the driver. It's not just about the, the driver increasing their capacity to cope with the stresses that are placed upon them by the job. And so um, one of the things that we've tested, and, and we've got some implementation information that's coming, is about um, uh, uh, providing support and um education interventions for those who manage drivers uh, about their ability to impact the, the driver's health and and by doing that we've actually found uh, we found something we basically found that there are some levels where people know exactly what's going on and the focus there needs to be about actually uh, empowering them to to make some changes and that, I think that came through in the Mentimeter survey before as well I'm not, not quite being sure what to do but there are some areas that there is a role in increasing the the awareness of their the ability of a manager to influence some of those areas of health. And that's where I think you know, it, it's exactly what Sharon's saying. We need to work out wh which things are uh, feasible and implementable um, now and what things do we actually need to leave later down the track? Because there's no point going in trying to empower everybody with something if they, if they don't even get why you're doing it first. And so that's part of, part of that process. You did ask how do we get the industry buy-in? And mm -hmm. I've, I've got some I've got some numbers for you. I've, I've shied away from numbers intentionally because that tends to, to switch people off a little bit. But we the, the final piece of the driving health puzzle has actually been to actually try and cost up what is what, what's the impact of the poor health of our, our driving workforce. Uh, and this um, this information is just going through peer review at the moment, but I don't expect these numbers to change much. But in the next 10 years, if we don't do anything to address the health of drivers, we expect it will cost $485 million in healthcare costs and $2.6 billion in lost productivity if we don't change the health of drivers. Uh, and sadly, it's estimated that more than 6,000 lives will be lost to work-related diseases or injury. And mm -hmm. decreasing the burden of poor health by just 2%, so just two percent. It's not. We're not talking any massive numbers here, but that's projected yeah. that it would save ten million dollars in healthcare costs and fifty-three million dollars in productivity. So there's a clear financial return on offer here, and that's in addition to actually looking after the great people in the industry. Yep. Thank you, Ross. I agree with that. And you know, it's it's very vital uh, that we we sort of uh, had to address these these factors into. Uh, the preservation of the transport industry that keeps the nation moving. It's it's very, I don't think, I think people don't, uh, sort of realise that after the COVID pandemic in the, and also the floods and fires, but that the only way they're going to get to these places is by road or, you know, through the, through the uh, trucking and logistic area. Thank you for that. Okay, so we're about to uh, give it a wrap up today. So thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Ross. Uh, we all appreciate you taking uh, time out of your busy schedules to uh, have this discussion, give us some uh, valuable insights uh, about the industry. Uh, uh, if anybody out there would like to know more about what has been discussed today, we'll be putting links on the Driving Health website uh, on the uh, Transport Network Forum information page. Uh, you'll find a series of six webinars that communicate the findings over the uh, three-year study, uh, each including a discussion panel with industry experts. So once again, thank you, uh, Ross. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, have a good day. And uh, that's it from Tassie. Thank you, Dean, Ross and Sharon for those insights. Very interesting, um, in particular for me with um, Ross's comment around the short haul drivers versus the long haul drivers. You see, it really makes sense, you know, short haul, big, uh, big truck in suburbia, con traffic congestion certainly would increase mental stress. And then conversely, the long haul journeys, uh, long periods of sedentary work would increase pain. So, yeah, a lot of food for thought there. Thank you. Uh, moving on, we do have a big program today. So a gentle reminder, if you are able, please do get up, stretch the legs and move about. Our next presenter is Melissa Weller from Healthy Heads in Trucks and Sheds. Melissa is the Director of Industry Relations and Program Management. We thank Melissa for joining us today to talk about some of the recent successes and upcoming initiatives of Healthy Heads. We may have some time for one or two questions for Melissa. If you do have one, 
please put it into the, the chat. Over to you, Melissa. Wonderful, great. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about Healthy Heads and uh, some of the work uh, we've been progressing over time. Okay, so Healthy Heads and Trucks and Sheds, we're a reasonably uh, new organisation. We are 18 months old now, um, and we were set up as an initiative by Industry for Industry, um, first established in 2020, um, to address specific challenges relating to mental health and wellbeing. Um, we are the overarching body for supporting uh, psychologically safe and thriving workplaces in the road transport, warehousing uh, and logistics industry. And um, we are coordinating a number of different programs um, to support awareness, leadership, and I'll go into um, some of our strategy as we move through the slides. Uh, we are a registered not-for-profit uh, and supported by a, um, a very active board of directors. Um, so why do we need healthy heads and trucks and sheds? Well, it's, it's an interesting conversation that was first started in a distribution centre in Woolworths uh, around improving mental health um, and awareness and wellbeing of workers in that environment it was very quickly realised that there was a need to also reach out to the drivers that were coming and going from the distribution centres as well for a more holistic approach. And some industry consultation took place, um, led by Woolworths and Paul Graham, who is now the chair of Healthy Heads, to see, well, what is it that industry wants and, and what's the best way to approach supporting better mental health and well-being within industry and it was quite unanimous that what we needed was an independent foundation um, that could work with industry um, to provide this support awareness um, and information and there is a very clear need and we've just heard Ross talking about um, some of the findings of the driving health report which is certainly information that we turn to regularly um, to look for uh, at the evidence base of some of the work that we do. Um, there was also the thriving work index uh, that is produced by Superfriend uh, as well. And there's a number of statistics that I've got up here in, in front of you um, that come from both uh, those sources and others. So we are an industry that is ranked 19 out of 19 in that thriving workplace index. 48% um, of workers have, a mental health con have um, experienced a mental health condition in the past 12 months. Um, 70% of drivers don't meet health and balanced diet guidelines and 50% of drivers are um, not physically fit. So we've got 40% uh, of drivers self-reporting experiencing loneliness and nearly 24% of drivers looking to exit the industry. So there's a lot of work to be done. Um, the model that Healthy Heads was set up on was really so that the larger end of town could support uh, anyone in the industry to access the resources and support and information that they need. So we do have a, um, a large support base from across industry uh, and we are primarily industry funded and we do receive some funding from the heavy vehicle um, safety initiative funding as well through the NHVR. Uh, as I mentioned, we are governed by a board of directors. Uh, Paul Graham, uh, the Managing Director of Australia Post, is our chair, and we have representation from trucking operators and other logistics um, organisations through our board. Our patron is Lindsay Fox, who is very passionate about um, mental health and wellbeing and has a very personal connection to the topic. Healthy Heads has been founded on um, three target ambitions, um, and that is to create awareness uh, and to build mental health literacy through education, to support um, the development of industry-specific resources, enabling access to these resources and support, um, and advocacy. So, um, evidencing and profiling industry mental health needs and advocating for um, 
and recommending solutions. And I'll talk about a few of those as we sort of progress through. We are advised by industry working groups. So it's really uh, important to um, bring that authenticity to what we are doing. And we gain advice directly from um, a diverse range of industry representatives through our working groups, uh, including uh, drivers and shed workers, supervisors, managers, schedule, schedulers, um, the research sector and experts from um, the mental health sector, sector as well. So we have um, four different forums. We have a training working group, and I'll talk about training a little bit shortly. Um, we have a standards working group, a wellbeing, awareness and education working group, and a group that um, guides our technology development, which has primarily been the development of our Healthy Heads app. One of the biggest steps for Healthy Heads was the launch of our national roadmap, um, which is um, the first unified um, national men mental health and wellbeing roadmap um, specific to the industry. And that roadmap is supported by a number of other resources, including our uh, guidelines, uh, which inc includes strategic action actions and how to implement these, and um, two versions of our handbook, um, which are aimed at individuals and at people leaders. Excitingly, there's another project behind the scenes that we're working on to support the implementation of the roadmap, and we are looking to trial um, a manual, if you like, um, or a workflow that we are creating that will also provide pro forma um, or example documents and frameworks that can be easily applied by businesses of all different sizes. So that's a bit of a watch this space for that one, uh, for something that we are um, developing in the background at the moment. It is wonderful to have launched a national strategy but we now need to make sure that anyone in the industry can understand that strategy and how it applies to them, regardless of what sort of size business or what type of business that they are. So the strategy, strategy itself is based on a best practice framework. Uh, so taking into account the industry um, risk factors and then looking at that best practice framework. So we've got seven workplace place strategies that the um, uh, roadmap addresses, and that is um, creating le leadership, um, better workplace cultures, smarter work design, uh, building resilience, early intervention, supporting recovery, and increasing awareness. Um, so a lot of the programs that um, we are currently delivering, and we've really been delivering programs now for about 12 months, um, with the first um, uh, sort of eight months or so of the life of Healthy Heads being really focused on delivering that national roadmap, which was developed in consultation uh, with those working groups and with an advisory board that's representative of industry. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of different uh, awareness raising programs that we have current at the moment. And we had our first uh, industry specific Are You OK in Trucks and Sheds Day um, just this week, which uh, was a huge success. So we have a formal partnership with Are You OK, who have their National Day in September. But we wanted to bring specific focus to our industry and have our own dedicated day where we have um, resources that uh, represent and resonate with um, this industry specifically. So we had an amazing response with over 80 different sort of activations across the country in all sorts of different businesses, um, across warehouses and trucking operators. Um, so it was an amazing, amazing response to that. And it's a really key awareness raising tool. The Are You OK brand is uh, very, very well recognised and the messaging itself is um, very simple and understandable and something that anyone can apply um, within a workplace or as an individual. We also have our roadshow truck. So this is our industry um, industry facing and um, 
our tool that we use to connect directly with our key audiences. Um, so we're out and about with the truck. We might be at a distribution centre. We might be at a service centre talking directly to drivers. Um, there is all sorts of different events that we hold um, with the truck as our backdrop. Um, but essentially the call to action from being out and about with the roadshow and connecting face to face with our audiences is to ask them to follow us on Facebook, to join as a member, which is free to any individual um, and business. Uh, and to access our resources through our website um, or to download our app. And once we have them connected with us in uh, one of those forms or, or all of those forms, it means that we can communicate regularly uh, with people and continue to raise that awareness and offer educational uh, information and access to support and resources. So we open up the truck. Here we're on site with um, Health and Gear who are offering their truckies tune-up health checks. Um, we, are, we have a national partnership with BP and BP are installing some always on activations within uh, I think 35 of their service centres across the country so drivers can access the information. They will see our um, branding and our resources from the backs of toilet doors through to um, stickers on the truck driver lounge tables where they can access a QR code and connect with us. We also hand out uh, our pocket guide, which is a very simple tool to remind um, our audiences to connect with us, to um, access information on our website, um, to become a member, to download our app, etc., and it also offers them a quick guide um, straight to some support resources and some helpful sort of daily um, basic sort of hints. Um, and I'm scooting through all of this because I know we're short on time and there's a lot going on. Um, the Gold Standard Heavy Vehicle Rest Area is a project that we are working on and our standards group will be advising this project also. Um, currently, we are running a scoping study um, with consultants TMX. Um, we are looking at what a gold standard heavy vehicle rest area might look like. Uh, we envisage that the project, after we have completed the scoping study, will move on to actually become a design and build of a prototype. And one thing that um, especially drivers will bring up straight away around this project, and it's a little bit about the narrative to the project and, and how we tell that. We don't want one gold standard rest area. We've got issues right across our network um, and, and we do understand that. But what this project aims to do also is to bring, um, bring some light to this issue and to amplify uh, the voice a little bit, but to also hold up um, a best practice prototype um, that can be a launching pad for further of these to be developed. And so, yes, we, we do consider that there's obviously a network issue here, but we want to look above and beyond what has been discussed and designed before. So the Osroad guidelines um, are a great base document with regard to design recommendations, but there's no obligation for um, road managers to apply those guidelines um, and there's no funding obligation to apply those guidelines. So what are the standards um, that industry requires and what is an example of absolute best practice? And working above and beyond means can we provide a private space where allied health professionals might be able to meet with drivers requiring an appointment? So your physio, et cetera, if, if you're a long haul truck driver and you're working six days a week, uh, you might be home on Sunday, you wanna spend that Sunday with the family, plus it's pretty hard to find a physio on a Sunday. So can we provide a space, for example, where drivers can access some of the things that we as um, workers take um, for granted that we can access generally. Um, looking at diet and nutrition, uh, looking at private spaces to connect home. Um, if we were to provide 
exercise facilities, whether that's a mini gym, whether it's a running track around the outside of the facility. Um, if we provided a ping pong table or a, um, a half court basketball court, would that encourage drivers to, um, you know, participate in an activity together and um, and create a bit more sense of community? So. We are not making assumptions about what this rest area will look like. We're consulting heavily with industry and that consultation is taking place now. The first part of the report um, has also looked at um, current uh, route analysis. Uh, it's looked at some crash statistics um, and a literature review of any current supporting information around um, this topic. Um, so we plan for this project to be delivered in three phases. We are currently in phase one, which is our evidence and proof of concept. That report is due end of this month. Um, design and construction would be next, uh, and then a strong lobby, lobbying and advocacy um, strategy included as well. So as I said, we are undertaking extensive consultation with industry and broader stakeholders. Um, and only in phase one of that project at the moment, which is um, raising a lot of a lot of interest. It's a really exciting project. It is ambitious, uh, and we we are aware of that. Um, and it's exciting. So uh, lots of lots of um, interest in that particular project at the moment. And a lot of these projects start to link together. So um, we're also working on the design of a diet and nutrition program, starting with a pilot that um, links to our current partnership with BP. So we're starting within service centres and we're looking at offering sort of fresher, healthier uh, meals incentivised by some discounts. Um, we want to coordinate edu educational content with those discounts. So, so for example, um, we may be talking about healthy snacking one week. So maybe the discount is a free water um, and a free snack, healthy snack choice of some sort. Um, another week we may be offering a fresh cooked meal at around the dinner sort of time. Um, and there might be a $5 discount off that meal, but we'll also be including um, educational content around why that choice is important uh, and what that choice means for the individual. So um, Nutrition Australia are um, very interested in this project and have offered to advise and they have um, uh, delivered other blue collar um, nutrition and behavioural change programs uh, previously. So we're looking to them for some advice on some best practice in, in this area. Uh, so this will also link to our Healthy Heads app and provides, provide some incentive for people to use that app uh, more often. So, uh, and I'll talk about the app a little bit more as we, as we move through. So we do offer training via our website. So we don't develop and design our own training. We are working with existing expert organisations who provide um, evidence-based training and what we do is we ask our training working group to trial the training programs and then we look at what aspects of that training needs to be tailored to industry so that it resonates with workers and that might be in some cases as simple as changing some imagery within the training or it might be that we need to adjust scenarios to better depict um, life within our industry, working life within our industry. Um, we currently have two offerings from Black Dog and Lifeline and we have AP Consulting. Our um, consulting psychologists have also developed a leadership course that offers some initial support to look at implementing actions within our roadmap. This month, our training working group is trialling two new programs, uh, training courses uh, with Lifeline. And what we want to ensure is that the suite of training that we have on offer reflects some of the actions within our roadmap. So that if we are um, recommending the development of certain capacity and skills within industry, then we've got a, we've got a suite of training courses that can also support that so they can come through our website um, and 
essentially book in for that training. So um, some more exciting development there over um, this year to see that training offering increased. We offer a, a set of toolbox talks and we are continuing to work on um, the delivery of these toolbox talks, but we do have some available online now, which simplify and um, cut our workbooks down into small chunks that can be delivered uh, to frontline staff in the workplace. So um, all of these things that I'm talking about today are all available on our website and anyone can go and access uh, access these. So um, our Healthy Heads app was essentially launched as a minimum viable product um, with a self-care um, check-in with links to information uh, and support. And we are now in the middle of our next six week build of our app, where we are going to link it to our diet and nutrition program. But also we're about to upload some new content that we've developed with St Kilda Football Club. So um, some great tips on uh, physical exercise uh, and also mindfulness. So we've been working with both um, the players and the club psychologist, Dr. Ben Robbins, who um, has some amazing tips on mindfulness and um, and is very, very relatable um, and very practiced at getting his message through to uh, a challenging audience being a, you know, a field of football players who just want to get out and kick a ball and succeed at their game and getting that type of um, group of people to slow down and think about mindfulness exercises is challenging, as you can imagine, and he just has a, an incredible manner and story behind how he encourages uh, them to consider their mental health at the forefront of everything they do. Um, so as I've said, everything is available on our Healthy, Healthy Heads website. Any one of you today can go and join up as a member and I would encourage you to do so. Our app is free to download and as I say, there are exciting releases coming for that uh, shortly as well. And um, on that note, with that very quick overview, I might stop sharing my screen. And um, yeah, to see if anyone's sort of got any questions, there's a lot happening there. <laughs> I feel like I'm just talking at everybody. Thank you very much, Melissa, for presenting on that uh, good initiative, the Healthy Heads in Trucks and Sheds. Really good there to see what the priorities are and everyone should keep their eyes open for, for that roadshow. Um, the website uh, for has been added up to the chat page and we encourage everybody to check that out. Thank you. And also encourage people to, to um, engage in the chat and please post up any any questions or thoughts as we go through. Um, our next presentation will be short and then we'll head to a to a break. So next we up is Chris Henderson. Uh, Chris is a colleague of mine. She's assistant director in Comcare's regulatory policy team. Uh, and Chris will share a quick update on on the upcoming campaign. Okay. Over to you, Chris. Thanks, Tom, for that introduction. As Tom said, my name is Chris and I'm an Assistant Director in the Regulatory Policy Team and I'm presenting today from the lands of the Ngunnawal people in the ACT. To give you a bit of um, background on uh, this campaign, in 2018, Comcare noted a slight increase in the work-related deaths and notifiable incidents in the road transport sector across the Commonwealth jurisdiction. Around the same time, Safe Work Australia statistics indicated that there were increases across all jurisdictions, suggesting that this is a national problem requiring a coordinated national approach. So Comcare raised this issue with members of the Heads of Work Safe Workplace Safety Authorities and regulators indicated that they also had similar issues. So the role of the group, as a result, members agreed that Comcare would lead a project to identify issues and resources to address the increasing rate of road fatalities resulting from non-driving related activities and to look at cross-jurisdictional approaches to controlling this harm. 
It was agreed that the project would be limited to non-driving or side of road activities, such as trans traffic management, working from heights, vehicle immobilisation and load shifting. To date, the group has undertaken a range of activities to identify the scope of the project, including an environmental scan of resources and jurisdictional regulatory activities and data and intelligence searches in each jurisdiction. A review of incident notification data across jurisdictions identified that the top mechanism of fatalities and injuries was vehicle collisions. However, regulators have very little influence in this area and as such, it was decided this would not be an, a priority area. Further analysis indicated that there were an increasing number of incidents resulting from vehicle rollaways across jurisdictions. While there are many causes of vehicle rollaways, data from incident notifications identified that in most cases, these incidents could have been prevented by simply applying a handbrake. Lack of and poor, rout poor or routine vehicle maintenance were also contributory factors. So as a result, it was agreed that the group would develop a safely immobilising vehicles as a workplace campaign. The, the campaign will comprise of two phases, a period of education and awareness, followed by a compliance phase. The aim of the campaign is to raise awareness and understanding of managing the risks of vehicle rollaways and encourage workplaces to implement controls for these risks in their safety management systems. The key message for um, this campaign will be if you drive a vehicle for work-related purposes, whether driving is a major or minor component of your job, the vehicle you are driving is a workplace under WHS laws. So what are the next steps? The community of practice is continuing to develop resources for the campaign ahead of the education and awareness phase rollout in late August, early September 2022. Once that phase is completed, we'll start a um, compliance phase in early um, 2023. So there's a bit of time ahead. So um, the community practice is continuing to move forward um, with these resources. So keep watching this space and we'll make sure that um, we have enough communication out to, um, to the industry as well as resources for you um, to use. Thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, just pop it into the, um, into the chat and I'll see what I can do to answer them for you. Thanks. Thank you, Chris, for those insights. And I think that's um, that, 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 that initially relevant, just not to the heavy vehicle industry, but to like you say, every uh, vehicle that's used on the road and a lot of, um, uh, Office workers and um, you know Commonwealth workers have cars, so that's uh, that's valuable to everyone. Thank you. We're now going to have a, a five-minute pit stop. Uh, time to uh, sorry about this. Time to get out the cab, refuel with a cuppa, and stretch your legs. We're all about uh, reducing um, body stressing, so please take that, use that five minutes wisely, and we will see you soon. Thank you. Okay, hope you're all back now from the short break. Have time to stretch your legs. Just, uh, just before we go back, I will we'll indulge in a little dad joke on the trucking thing to lighten things up. I heard during the break that there was a truckload of uh, strawberries that had uh, overturned onto the freeway here in Adelaide. Police said it caused terrible traffic jam. Sorry about that. We'll move on. Anyway, we'll jump straight into our next session, which is the people at work talk. So first up, we'll have Andrew to give a brief overview and an update on the tool, and then we'll introduce Simon from KNS Freighters to deliver a case study. We may have some time for one or two questions for Andrew and Simon at the end. If you do have one, please put it into the chat. <clears throat> Excuse me. So by way of introduction, uh, Andrew Waits is a registered psychologist. He has a background in law enforcement, mediation and organisational culture consultancy roles and for the last 11 years has worked in clinical mental health in both private practice and hospital settings. Andrew joined Comcare in January 2022 as the Assistant Director of the recently created 
psychosocial risk regulation team that Justin Napier uh, referenced earlier. So without further ado, over to you, Andrew. Thanks, Tom, and um, great joke, great joke. Um, yeah, so as Tom said, I'm, I'm Andrew, a psychologist and assistant director of the psychosocial risk regulation team in, in Comcare. Um, I'm joining you from Brisbane, the lands of the Turrbal and, and Jagra people, and I'd like to pay my respect to those traditional custodians of this land. I'm here today to give you a brief overview um, of the people at work tool and why we think it's useful and important in the prevention and, and management of psychosocial risks prior to introducing Simon from KNS Freighters. Earlier in Justin's opening, he, he mentioned the establishment of the team I'm in, the Psychosocial Risk Regulation Team, which is a new initiative for Comcare. So the initial focus of the team is to provide information and resources to employers and employees around understanding and, and uh, control of psychosocial risks. Reviewing and processes and procedures that we have and, and establishing new ones as necessary, but also supporting and building the capabilities of our inspectors. From a regulator's point of view, there are work, work health and safety duties that apply under the Work Health and Safety Acts at the Commonwealth level and at and state level. This means that persons conducting a business or undertaking, PCBUs, such as employers, must eliminate risks from psychosocial hazards if it is reasonably practical to do so. If you can't eliminate these risks, you must minimise them so far as is reasonably practicable. But it's, it's more than just compliance with the law that is important to acknowledge. Psychosocial hazards in the workplace result in significant costs to industry, workers and their families, socially and in time lost illness, as well as, of course, financially. The median time loss for work for psychological claims in 2021 was about 18 weeks compared to five weeks for physical injury claims. So, so you can imagine the cost difference. Although mental stress claims accounted for approximately 8% of accepted claims, those claims took up 27% of claim costs at the Commonwealth level. It's also worth noting, um, as, as Justin mentioned earlier as well, that there are codes of practice and regulations focused on psychosocial hazards starting to be released within the different jurisdictions. And they'll, they'll most likely result in more reporting requirements and increased regulatory focus on psychosocial hazards. But they'll also provide more concrete guidance on psychosocial hazards and risk management. Comcare and, and, and other organisations will, of course, also update and provide guidance as this happens in, in our jurisdiction. But there's lots of useful guidance already out there. One is the uh, Safe Work Australia Guide uh, Work Related Psychological Health and Safety, a, a systematic approach to meeting your duties, and that should be linked in the chat. So, people at work. The people at work tool is not new. The survey that sits behind it has been around for about 15 years. It, it also has the full backing of Australia's workplace health and safety regulators as a way to help you meet your health and safety duties. The Mentimeter activity before surveyed you on your understanding and confidence in managing psychosocial hazards and risks. People at work can help you with that. Comcare is promoting people at work because it is a validated and evidence-based psychosocial risk assessment survey tool with benchmarking reports across industries. It is also a digital tool, it's easy to use, and uh, perhaps best of all, it's free. At, at this stage, there is limited data available for the transport and logistics industry. The, the data from the tool can be used not just by you to identify and monitor hazards and risks in your workplace, but aggregated benchmarking data can influence our future activities to better support the management and prevention of specific hazards and risks in this industry. So the call to action today is to listen to Simon's case study and consider it if it will be re relevant to apply to your workplace. At its heart, the tool is a five-step process. Um, 
the tool is a five step process uh, to identify and manage psychosocial risks and hazards in the workplace. The process supports organisations to prepare the workplace, conduct a validated and benchmark survey, assess the results and put in place action plans to drive improvements. The, the resources are available, applicable for any organisation size, but you need to have 20 or more workers to run the survey for privacy reasons. Well, let's see it in action. Please allow me to introduce Simon, who will talk you through a case study where he implemented the tool into his workplace. Simon is the Executive General Manager, Health, Safety and Environment and Compliance at KNS Raiders, a leading Australian and New Zealand logistics provider. Simon joined KNS in 1990, holding numerous positions. Since 2018, he's been a board member of the Australian Trucking Association. Welcome, Simon. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and appreciate the opportunity to share with all those today our journey um, in using the uh, tool uh, kit um, known as People at Work. Hopefully I'll get this technology right. Um, what I'm going to try and cover off today is just a couple of items, is how to assess mental health or psychosocial risks. Um, a little bit more about the people at work um, tool that we um, discovered some years back. Um, going to cover off what it actually is, um, what are some of the measures um, that it produces, and what is involved in actually implementing um, the people at work program. Um, and some of our, I guess, experiences, uh, good or bad, or learning lessons that we encountered in um, this journey itself. So I'm going to use uh, a little bit of a, a question here. We all know about food. Um, I guess we've all been using it since we were born. Um, but uh, my question is going to be is how familiar or has anybody heard of these three items of food? Um, and if you're struggling with the interpretation, I'll do my best. First one, sarma, kiflitze, and majaritze. Um, just use your little uh, reaction buttons if you've ever even heard of these uh, food types. Oh, there's a few gobs maxed. Now, it's a little bit, we all know about food, but I'm certainly no master chef. Now, when I put a little picture together, against the words, um, it creates a different picture now in my mind of what these things uh, are or could be. Now I'm going to use another little straw poll. How many of these do you think, oh there's a few love hearts on that one, um, do you think that you could actually cook up um, and prepare? Um, who wants to have a go? Yes, got a winner there. Um, I'll be honest, I probably um, a little bit of a on the right side. I liked my sweets. Um, I certainly could not make the two dishes, but with the help of my two daughters, I, I'm a little bit more confident in uh, making those two meals. The third one's a, a bit of a tricky one for me. So when we came into this space of mental health or psychosocial risks, it's a little bit like walking into the unknown. Um, we know the term, we hear the words, but what does this look like? And can I actually handle it? Can I do something with it? Can I produce something with it? So I'm going to walk through a little bit about how to actually do this assessment. Um, so what does it what does it in include? It includes recognises the hazards and the risks related mainly around work related stresses. And they can be physical, they can be mental or any emotional reaction where a worker may perceive that they just don't have the ability or resources to cope. And there's a number of factors that um, I'll talk a little bit later that comes up in a tool, but they, they, they include job demands, support, control of work, clarity, change management, which was brought up earlier, rewards and recognition, um, environmental uh, factors, type of work that may be remote or isolated, and traumatic events or violence in the workplace. 
Um, there is a lot of literature out there. Um, with all due respect to those that have written some of these guidelines, documents um, can become confusing. It's a little bit like giving me a recipe book and asking me to bake a cake. I know I've got the book, but I'm certainly not confident in baking. And some of this material, whilst it's uh, trying to be very helpful, can also become very confusing. Um, we, as an organisation, when we started looking at this topic, um, for whatever reason and however I come up, I can't actually recall, stumbled across, came across this particular uh, package of work called People at Work. And the little, um, you know, uh, letters of anecdote of poor just resonate very quickly and easy to remember. Now, we discovered it somewhere around about early, mid-June 2018, um, when we were looking at this whole issue of mental health. So what does it cover off? Well, it's a process. Um, in trying to assess psychosocial risks in your workplace. Um, the product at the time has a survey tool, which I found extremely valuable. And it's a little bit like, back to my cooking um, analogy, it gives you all the ingredients that you know to move ahead in this particular area. Um, there is a survey tool, there's administrative instructions, there's guidelines, kit templates, and a whole heap of communication material project plans that we found very much ready to go and adapt for your specific workplace. The survey itself, it covers off in main two main topics or two main areas, which are job demands and job resources. And you can see within those particular two elements, there is a number of factors that's considered. I'm not going to repeat all of them. You can see them on the screen and I'll cover them a little bit more in detail through our journey itself. It also covers off exposure to workplace bullying. And then the third area that it covers off is a range of other outcomes that it pre predicts that as a result of this, um, your state of job demand and job resourcing hazards, that you may end up having a higher potential for musculoskeletal, job burnout, sleep disorders or absenteeism or other factors that may also be impacted. As Andrew mentioned, there's five phases in the implementation of people at work. There's a preparation phase, a determining phase, an engaging with your workers phase, an implementation of actions once you've got your data, and then re reviewing and monitoring and continually trying to identify ways of improving further. Um, as far as the survey is concerned, um, there's four main key areas. Uh, how to plan to do the survey, um, at an administrative function behind the survey, how to collate and analyse your data, and then more importantly, how to produce the results and share those results with your respective work areas. I'm going to talk about the planning stage and what we did um, at KNS. As I said earlier in the piece, um, we came across the tool and we wanted to hear more about it. So we invited Comcare to come and present at our national safety conference back in 2018 and take questions from our executive and national managers, which they did, and provide us a, a more of an insight of what was possible, what we needed to, uh, I guess, consider um, to roll out this program across our business. We established a steering committee within the executive group, uh, which was headed up by three senior executives to ensure there was buy-in, leadership and commitment to the program. The second stage is that we looked at the survey itself. And I'm going to reflect back what the survey looks like then, and it's certainly been enhanced since then. So I will be talking about the survey tool as it was back in 2019. It was effectively a manual process. 
handing out survey sheets, collecting those survey sheets, and then data collecting and putting those survey sheets in some sort of tool that was in um, the package. We elected to um, take the survey questions and use SurveyMonkey to electronically collect the data. And why we did that is we rolled out this program across our whole business nationally. So shuffling paperwork around states, around businesses, around branches, and we had something like 44 of them across the nation, we felt that that was going to be an administrative burden and the results and the paperwork would probably be lost somewhere. And we thought, let's try and do this electronically, which we did. We wanted to capture the whole of business. So not one branch, we were quite adventurous, not one division, not one segment. So in the background, we gen generated some, I'll call it some general questions to make sure that we were getting data from all of our divisions, unidentified obviously who the person was that was completing the survey. Their use of survey uh, service in the industry, um, what state they resided in or worked in, and what role or profile they had within the business, such as were they part of the admin team, were they part of workshop, were they a driver, or were they a yard person or a warehouse person or a contractor? Um, we wanted to understand that we were getting feedback from all of our profiles. Um, our target was to, oh, sorry, we launched the uh, uh, pro program through a whole heap of communique um, through our intranet, through emails, through toolbox safety talks, uh, through letters, through payroll, through uh, pay slips. There was a number of mediums that we used to ensure that people were aware that we'd launched the survey and asked them to participate. Um, we determined originally that six weeks, and that was within the guidelines, that we should have the survey launched and that we should have the results. We targeted approximately 30%, which was in that time over 600 workers within our business. Eventually, we did get 688 responses, which effectively closed the survey, and we used that as our data um, to see where we are as first time, first timers in doing something like this, and this becomes now our benchmark. The th one thing that we did not expect, and it's guess one of those learning lessons, is how long it was going to take us to get that 30% target. Once we launched the program back in um, July of 2019, we got basically 15% respondees immediately. But thereafter, it was a long road to try and get that target. Now, why people didn't respond, why people didn't participate is uh, still learning for us. Um, some anecdotal information is hesitancy, um, where is this going to go to, and even people just opening up about mental health and, and their feelings about work um, could be one of the barriers that we just did not anticipate. However, we were quite determined in trying to meet our target, so we continued to promote the survey itself. And as you can see through the periods there, we had some uptake and then we plateaued and then we had a huge uptake and we meet, met our target. So one of the learning lessons that we got here is that you probably need to build in a safety margin if you're going to undertake this type of a survey because you may not understand your responses of your employees in this particular area. And now we have a bit of appreciation of what that may or may not look like. Our third phase was data collection, which we did. And the fourth phase that we had was effectively reviewing the initial results through the steering committee, which we completed, and the presentation of those results back to our executive health and safety committee. That's where our project basically um, paused, not deliberately, but this was the then end of 2019, the beginning of 2020. And as we all now appreciate, um, the COVID pandemic started around about February, March, 
Um, and our focus of many of us in the transport logistics industry become totally different. So we got to sort of the end of the program, not enough to implement, but we do have a baseline data of what our business did look like back in 2019 when it comes to psychosocial hazards and risks. Now I'm going to share a couple of more slides so you can see what the actual product does uh, produce. Um, now, first of all, you will get a hazard dashboard. That dashboard will um, contain four charts. Um, the numbers there are illustration, and as Andrew uh, did mention, the grey numbers are the industry data that the poor uh, project did collect, and I correct me if I'm wrong, Andrew, I think it was some Queensland transport data at the time, but the blue, dark blue on the left, on the left charts will be your actual results. The aim here is obviously to have uh, your job demands as low as possible and your job resourcing high as possible to give you a state of what your psychosocial, I, I guess, rainbow colours are like. The right side of the table is going to indicate to you your risks of low, moderate and high areas um, and which are likely to become your negative outcomes associated with exposures. So this is the responses and where they're coming from. The second piece of information you will get out of the survey dashboard is a bullying dashboard. It basically covers off three elements. One is um, the experience of people in um, of workplace bullying. The second is witnessing workplace bullying. And the third is where that workplace bullying is come from. Now, and then the uh, right side will give you some breakdown and overviews of averages of, of what that information um, contains. That is the second element that comes out of this out of this tool. The third element is an outcome outcomes dashboard, which aims to, except for one element, which is job satisfaction, the others tends to give you a insight of what your personnel experiencing and suggest what particular consequences you may have in the areas of manual handling, job burnout, sleep patterns and so forth. So that is in short our experience with um, the pause tool. I'm going to finish off on uh, uh, one slide. Um, and as has been mentioned and, and I welcome the uh, previous speakers, trucking has had a very challenging time um, at, to say the least. Uh, we've had to learn to adapt and respond very quickly and in many cases without notice. Um, there has been some tremendous recognition of transport um, in that period. However, we do suffer from um, recognition um, being maintained. And I came across, and I'm aware of a campaign many, many, many years ago that the trucking industry ran to try and generate that respect, uh, which didn't go far. And unfortunately, a pandemic sort of woke most of the world up about logistics and trucking. So I'd like to just remind you of a little campaign that uh, we did have many, many years ago about trucks and what we do do and what we do deliver almost. Um, I'm going to finish up there and happy Andrew to pass back to you and take any questions if there is. Thanks, Simon. Any questions? Nothing coming up in chat? Thanks, Andrew, and thank you, Simon. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, we are uh, we are running a little bit uh, late for time, so if there are any any questions or, or any comments, please encourage you to uh, put them in the in the chat there. But yeah, thanks again, Andrew, and um, Simon for your um, insights. Um, we are in the last at the last session for the day, um, and we have a great group of people from across the industry who will talk uh, about what we have. Uh, what we have learned and what is to come.
Now, just note at this point, we are running slightly over. It's the joy of these uh, virtual events and some minor tech issues. So we are expecting the panel to go approximately 10 minutes over, but we have such a, a great panel, we don't want to cut it short. So we welcome everyone to stay on a bit longer if you can. But we also understand if you have to leave, um, we appreciate your time in joining us for whatever you can to fit in to your busy diaries. So, <clears throat> so Beth Smith, who I introduced earlier, will lead this panel and I'll now hand over to her. Over to you, Beth. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're all enjoying the forum. So over this session, you will hear from a cross-sectional group of people working within the transport and logistics industry. As we're all aware, there are existing challenges, including body stressing and an aging workforce prior to the crisis management mode we've found ourselves in for the last three years. This has undoubtedly had a significant impact on workers and their lifestyles. Our panel will talk about their lived experience over the past three years, from fires to pandemics, to running out of toilet paper, to the recent floods, amongst other challenges. This is an opportunity to hear some stories about the hardship, how they found resilience, and were supported through what was a very challenging new experience. For those tuning in today, you may resonate with some of the stories told, or for others, it may give you insight into the hurdles faced. We hope you all take something away from this session, and I do want to thank our panel members, who I'll introduce in a moment, for their willingness to share their personal experiences with us. So, with over 25 years in transport and mining across Australia and international, Scott Buckingham from KNS Freighters joins us to talk about his experience managing operations across several sites in Victoria and South Australia. Scott is now the National Health, Safety and Environment Manager for KNS Freighters. We also have Paul Victor joining us from Lynn Fox. Paul began working for Lynn Fox in 2005 and is a professional driver and health and safety representative for over 190 drivers for the last five years. Paul is currently completing a postgraduate certificate in safety management through Griffith University. <coughs> Excuse me. From DHL supply chain, we welcome Matt Del Moro. Matt was part of DHL's COVID pandemic team who saw him working with all sites to coordinate activities during the height of the pandemic. Prior to DHL, he worked as a compliance manager in the transport industry. Last but not least, Ross Isles from Monash University who spoke earlier with Dean and Sharon is joining us. Ross is the lead researcher in Driving Health Program and will provide a valuable insight into the research findings. So look, welcome Scott, Paul, Matt and Ross. So we'll start with the first question to the panel and it's around how have your last three years been and, and what are some of the biggest challenges you've had in balancing work, health and safety and wellbeing? So I might start with Scott, um, who is from KNS Freighters, and, um, and then we'll move to the other panel members. Thanks, Bev, uh, and for the introduction. Uh, just to start again, I'd like to thank the traditional owners, uh, the Bunurong people, uh, for the area that I'm at today, which is Truganina. Um, and I guess the last three years is, has been an interesting journey from Truganina. It, it, it has the postcode 3029, which has been the highest postcode for COVID cases um, throughout the last uh, two and a half years. And for me, um, really, I, I think of the last two and a half years as in, in two phases. The first phase was around uh, the start of the pandemic, uh, all of the things that we began to do to control and change our business, uh, the introduction of of permits for essential workers, uh, isolation requirements, and really that first 18 months was just a, a continual rolling, changing, uh, lots of demands from different parts um, of, of our business, our customers, but also things like border challenges and having to work across different state borders from Victoria to South Australia. Um, and for my role, I looked after the operations. Uh, I've now moved into a safety role, but for the last two and a half, three years through the pandemic was in that operations role. The change for me was probably the last uh, little over six months going to 12 months. So Omicron um, really changed things for us. Uh, up till then, we had been very happy to not have a positive case in our truck and operation or at any of our other sites that I look after across South Australia and Victoria. But Omicron changed gears. Um, the number of cases increases dramatically. 
uh, for us, for our customers, and having to manage a business with lots of people away, lots of people isolating, sort of rolling isolations from children, family members, employees, and those sort of knock-on effects. Uh, it took a lot out of a lot of us, uh, including myself. Um, but yeah, that's the last three years for me, two distinct phases, uh, a lot of change, um, and also a little bit of recognition uh, from others that trucks, uh, truck drivers are actually important. Um, and that's probably the positive I take out of that, that three year period. Okay, thanks, Scott. Look, I might go to Paul um, and to, to get a perspective um, from yourself as a driver, um, what, what the challenges have been for you and, and other drivers in the industry over the past three years and what you've experienced. Uh, thank you, Beth. Um, yes, um, for me and other truck drivers in the industry, um, coming just out of Christmas, which is our busiest season, and then going into COVID, and going in even extra overdrive where our loads even doubled from Christmas. It, it was just um, a first for us. Um, usually the driver is kind of looking forward for after the Christmas period and after Easter to um, go on holidays. Suddenly they couldn't go anywhere, so they all cancelled um, their holidays. Um, also um, with that um, came the extra fatigue, the long hours. We, we needed a, all hands on deck, and um, um, the drivers felt a big responsibility, and they felt a responsibility to, towards the community to supply food and keep the supply chain happening. Um, so they had a lot of extra stress on top of the normal stre everyday stresses um, that they um, concentrated on, but also the, the stress of possibly bringing the virus home to their families afterwards. Um, it, it caused a lot of um, anxiety, and they were really after facts. They were looking for facts so they can know how to manage it. And being such a new thing, uh, no one had the facts. No one could supply the facts to them. So um, there was a lot of conversations, which is good. At least, um, you know, the drivers had the, um, um, the camaraderie to talk to one another and, with, and, and share ideas and share ways of actually um, coping through the period and there was great matchup which was excellent to see within the yard. Look thanks Paul for that insight. Um, look I can only imagine that the type of challenges for those of us who had the benefit of working from home we can uh, only sit back and appreciate what what the drivers did and 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 what they went through to sort of keep us in food and toilet paper and all those necessities so look thank you very much for sharing that matt i might turn to you you worked as a work health and safety advisor at dhl um what additional challenges did you see in 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 that organization Thanks, Bev. Yeah, um, we, as an essential service and supply chain business, um, we remained open and 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 operating throughout the pandemic. The real challenges that we 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 tended to see was how to keep our employees um, safe um, while at work, because we obviously had our warehouse staff in full swing. So there was a big big challenge to manage that internally. So. We looked at doing things like splitting our, our shifts up into an AM and a PM shift, uh, keeping everybody separate in their lunch breaks, um, having different parts of the warehouses segregated into um, certain areas where only uh, certain agencies could, could operate. So there was that logistical challenge initially. And then we had the cases to start, um, start appearing on site. So a lot of our um, sites in Sydney are based uh, in, in Western Sydney and where the, the hot spots were, where a lot of these cases were, were quite prevalent. So um, we actually needed to develop some sort of a, a track and tracing system, uh, which was, which was um, a bit of a mammoth task to, to really, um, when we did have a positive case on site, we were able to, um, you know, track them, track their shift, uh, review CCTV footage, uh, conduct interviews, uh, and identify the, the close and casual contacts related to that positive case. Um, so we actually did this in um, in conjunction with New South Wales Health. So we had a, a constant open communication line with um, New South Wales Health and their pandemic response team. Uh, and we were able to um, minimise any sort of transmission on our sites when we did have a positive case. Another challenge that I'd like to briefly touch on was we, um, a lot of our staff felt very, uh, the, the, 
very heavy burden of, of continuing to work as we had we were responsible for the the national vaccine rollout so all the vaccines um, came to one of our sites in, in Western Sydney and so there was a big um, you know burn on it on the shoulder of our employees to ensure that it, you know, our communities were kept safe that we can get these we can continue to operate and get these vaccines out to all the sites um, that that needed them so there was also a challenge there to to keep open to, to ensure minimal disruption to our business to ensure that you know the vaccine rollout could could um, move forward as, as planned thanks matt and i mean that vaccine rollout was obviously absolutely critical to australia and i can only imagine the pressure because you know there there was that sort of delay period where you know we were waiting for those vaccines so so i mean i'm sure everybody's very appreciative to the the trucking industry for for that piece of logistics work um, which was done ross i might just ask you in terms of your research over the last three years um and and how that experience might have influenced that well i, I bring a completely different perspective i've, I've never driven a truck I, I don't work in transport but what um, what's been described by Scott, Paul and Matt, they're all things that we found were an issue uh, in our research, which was the data was collected right at the sort of the beginning point of, um, of the pandemic. And they were an issue then. And But what has been described is all of those things would have, would have gotten worse. Uh, and it's mentioned in the chat there and too, things like access to rest facilities were restricted. Drivers told us in our interviews that one of the things that really influenced them was the, the lack of respect they got from the general public in terms of the, the job that they do and, and how they're treated out on the road. So on, on one hand, I guess there was a, there's a, um, there's been a, I think there's at least been a, a bit of a shift in terms of the importance of the, of the transport chains and, and keeping um, the supply chains working. Um, but throughout that period, there, there was, you know, clear impacts for the, for the individuals who were, who were doing such hard work and important work has been, has been pointed out. So from a research perspective, we can only assume that the, the picture that we found is, is really now a significant underestimate of how difficult it is for drivers to be healthy and stay healthy at work. Thanks, Ross. So look, what what I might do is um, now talk about what are some of the impacts more that you've seen across your colleagues in the workforce. So we've talked more at the organisational community level. So Paul, I might go to you first in terms of the impacts you've seen across drivers um, in, in terms of the last three years. Um, I, I think, um from a driver's perspective and talking to the drivers, um, they they need more assistance. They 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 feel it's them on the road alone. Once they leave the yard, it's them. And to face the challenges, um, everyday challenges like traffic, um, we actually it's quite funny. We had the public following us to the back docks and and stop in front of the truck and say, "Oh, do you have toilet paper on board?" You know. Um, um, it was very interesting and um, it has its positives and negatives because we don't want the public close to a truck because they don't understand how a truck maneuvers, so we don't want them there. But on the other hand, it had a positive effect because the truck drivers felt even more valued, which is so important. Um, um, and I think um, from their perspective, um, so on one hand, they are tired, but they feel like this great um, responsibility that the job needs to be done um, but then they have a responsibility to their families and seeing their families one day a week and all they do is sleep to catch up on lost sleep and tiredness I think the balance for the last three years hasn't been there they haven't had um, time to um, spend with their family and I have noticed that in the last three years the incidence of um, uh, domestic troubles, uh, uh, divorce has gone up. So, and that has got a massive impact on a driver. I, I, you can just see it when they come to work. You can see they're not themselves. So um, yeah, it, it definitely had a, a negative impact as well for some, some of them. Um, yeah, that's my experience. 
Thanks, Paul. And look, that was probably reflected in the Mentimeter discussion where we saw that real increase in, in you know, the psychological risks being right at the top of the sort of the, the profile of what people were concerned around. So it certainly, um, you know, created that, that those additional stresses are reflected in, in that feedback. So Matt, I might go to you in terms of um, you've worked working as a work health and safety advisor across the organisation. You know more broadly what what impacts you saw across on on the actual workers in in DHL. Yeah, so as I discussed previously, there we we had to do a, a to ensure we could manage to keep the business and the warehouses operational. We we managed our split shifts so. Normally, our, our guys would be working a 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, shift and they'd, they'd go home. However, we needed to make split that in half and have half the guys working an a.m. and then an half the p.m. So the a.m. would go from 6 to 6 to 2 and then the, the p.m. Would, would start at 3 and go to 11. So the, the, the main thing that I or the impact that I saw across that sort of change was um, mainly a lot of the guys who were working on the p.m. shifts. Um, it was a complete change of of um, routine for them. So a lot of them have young families, uh, have uh, ki young kids, and they're obviously working very antisocial hours because of the pandemic. So uh, this coupled with with the the risk of COVID on site was, I think, a big mental challenge for a lot of our employees. Um, I had a few come up to me and discuss, you know, I haven't seen I haven't seen my children or my kids in, in a while because I'm working these 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 later shifts, and we, we try to to minimise that that impact by by having the uh, swapping these these shifts around, but in the end, I think the the mental strain of of the change of routine, and and the the requirement for for the isolation rules kind of really reined in on on some of our employees. Um, similarly, when we did have a positive case on site, um, even though from from a risk point of view, there was minimal risk to of of contact or transmission, we did have to notify the site as part of our obligation. And we did find that a lot of this staff did were, were unnecessarily stressed, although it's it's you know you can understand why. So there was a lot of stress uh, and uncertainty on on um, because we were still in the, in the height of the pandemic of the Delta strain. So this was middle of last year, and there was that very that whenever we did have a positive case on site, um, workers were becoming stressed and and a bit worried for their for their health and safety. So that was a, a big challenge for us as well. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Uh, um, you know, and then I. That challenge um, for the rest of us, we we experienced that when we all started to come back to work. So, um, whereas you had that throughout the whole three years of 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 the pandemic, Scott, in terms of KNS freighters, is there anything further you'd like to add in terms of 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 those experiences? Hi everyone, I'm back. I think I'm living the experience of the last three years. Um, the system shut down, no computer. I've run across to Simon's desk, so I think you might see a different name at the bottom. Uh, sorry, I've missed uh, a lot of those questions. What was that, Bev? OK, so we're just asking what are some of the impacts you saw across your colleagues? And given you had that sort of more national role, um, looking at it from a more national perspective um, at KNS, um, what, what impacts you saw on the workers in your organisation? Yeah, look, I might, um, my national role is a great role. I've been in it two weeks, um, but I might talk about my operations role in Victoria. Yeah, yeah. I think that's probably the, the lived experience that's worthwhile. Uh, and, you know, for me, um, I've come to work every day and I've worked exceptionally long hours and so have all of the leaders. Um, a lot of the admin team have been able to work from home and we've been able to take some operational areas and move them between sites to kind of decentralise so that if any one site was to get COVID, it wouldn't necessarily go down and take out a part of our business. So we've been doing a lot of work to build that resilience. Um, but that's in Victoria, where we've needed permits to come to work. Um, so we had to have times on our permits for when we could and couldn't drive. We had uh, evening curfews. I've had to run out of here and get home to then start up again to come in and keep moving through those things. And we've been through this world of lockdowns, so too many to count, five kilometres, 10 kilometres, back to five, up to 15. And for a lot of us in transport, we don't have the biggest social networks anyway. And when you start putting a five kilometre radius on it, um, you know, I think 
what I listened to earlier when Ross was talking about the difference between long haul and short haul, that really resonated with me because I had short haul drivers asking if they could do long haul work, even with the testing at the borders, back and forwards, in and out and needing permits and the licenses, because they'd begun to go a little crazy being in a 5K bubble and only able to go back and forwards and do local work. So the ability to actually sit in the truck and do something long distance and change that was something that drivers were knocking on the door. And it was at the perfect time for me because I had more freight than I knew what to deal with. And we were always having line haul drivers that were going into or out of isolation, especially in the last little while. But that that real impact on social networks for an industry potentially where there's already not a lot of social networks, um, that played out on every level, uh, admin teams, warehouse teams, drivers, and that's a uniquely, in my view, Victorian sort of feeling because I'm working with other state managers who are negotiating the same border issues, but maybe not having that same experience of they they can't go anywhere except to their to their shop, um, get out for an hour and do a bit of exercise, and and that's it. Mm. Yeah, look, that uh, it's interesting hearing that Victorian experience. I mean, we, I mean, many of us had Victorian colleagues during that period of lockdown, and it, I, I imagine it was it was particularly challenging. It's interesting to hear that impact uh, on drivers. Um, it's also interesting to sort of understand around families and Ross, I know in your research you did talk to families, so it'd be interesting to hear what sort of your research showed in terms of those impacts during that period. Um, yeah, we, we we interviewed drivers and their um, and their family members at depth. We ended up to um, 15 of those interviews. Um, and what I'll, I'll just describe a couple of things that struck me um, with that that would only be emphasised through the through the COVID period. Um, the first one being that um, you know, a driver describing that he'd been away from home for so long and was really looking forward to getting home, but then when you get when he when he got there, everything was functioning really well without him. So there be use. He was the the family was operating, and him being there was actually he he felt like he was in the way. Um, so they actually fun functioned fine without him. So he was so much, you know, looking forward to being home, really looking forward to it, getting there and actually feeling awkward um, and not necessarily being able to feel as comfortable as um, as it, um, as you would normally. And that would be emphasised if you're worried that, well, I could be introducing COVID to, you know, to my family unit and, and that sort of thing. And so looking forward to being home very quickly turned to looking forward to being away again without a period of you know real rest and, and comfort in between um so that was that was one thing that that um stood out for me and i guess talking a little bit about that that antisocial schedule the thing might have needed to to change there was describers uh, drivers described a real pressure or, or, or like they let the family down when they couldn't be reliable they couldn't be relied on to be at the school concert or or to be at you know John, little johnny's pickup or, or whatever it would be that, that that actually weighed really quite heavily on the on the drivers that they just couldn't be relied on for a lot of those things and they were really torn between the importance of what it was that they had to do versus you know the importance of their family and and it and I think in the research that comes up as as that psychological distress um, that would just you know be going through the roof. That's really interesting. And I suppose you know this conversation shows that um, there were clearly some very significant personal stresses caused by the last three years. So my next question to you is is what did you do? You've clearly been through those personal stresses yourselves, and and what did you witness to help them? And I might start off with Scott in terms of your experience in KNS Freighters. Yeah, thanks, Bev. Um, I think Simon's session just before talked about uh, poor and how it was applied, um, and that was quite an effort to get 600 odd, more than 600, 700 people through that survey. So that came off the back of lots of small conversations, which in the end. Uh, was very helpful. It made a bit of a bit more connection between leaders, uh, drivers, workshop, warehouse uh, employees. And I think it really became important at that, that point in Victoria where you needed to be immunised to come to work. There was quite a lot of misinformation, quite a lot of confused understanding as to what was happening, what were people putting into their bodies. And there were lots of small conversations, um, hundreds of small conversations as people 
um, looked for where to get information. Um, and from my point of view, you would get information uh, every morning at around 11 o'clock, but it'd be devastating. It'd be the number of cases and how bad things were. So you could kind of find yourself getting worn down. Um, but the positive there, I think, is that you could have those conversations. So both ways, um, me as a leader, being able to reflect off people and, and, and have things allowed me to de-stress a little bit and talk. And, and by and large, with the exception of just a handful of people, everyone did go through and do their, their, um, their, uh, their immunizations uh, and went through the process. And I think Paul, you mentioned earlier, felt that pride in being part of a solution. So being that chain that was connecting people. And, you know, for us, literally, we moved toilet paper and we went from moving four trucks a day to moving 12 trucks a day. And we've done that for three years nonstop. So, you know, it's, uh, it's that kind of experience, Bev. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks for that, Ross. I mean, Scott, um, I might ask Paul now in terms of the driver's experience in, in, in you know, what sort of personal stresses you may have gone through, Paul, yourself or witnessed with, with your colleagues? Um, Bev, um, apart from the everyday stresses, um, the other personal stresses for me personally was, you know, I, I'll try to keep the rest of the drivers happy. Um, I'm try. they come to me for, um, uh, with questions, just like, as, um, Scott said, you know, um, that m hundreds of small conversations and if you don't have the answers to give them or you're not sure yourself, um, it, it does leave you um, feeling a bit helpless. Um, and then we've got the normal stresses on top of it. Um, you know, um, we're just taking the loads out. But you still have to comply with the law. You still have to have your break in within five hours. And you've got a six-way split on, you don't know where you're going to park. And it's very stressful. Um, I, I know Ross uh, has um, mentioned it before, but it, it, it's really true. Like, you know, you've got the public putting the drivers at risk already and not respecting trucks in the first place. So you've got all that negativity and stress on the roads already. But then you have to find a place in the city to park. And, and, and that's so important, long haul and, um, you know, the local deliveries um, has got very uh, different sets of challenges. So usually there is set places between Sydney and Brisbane to stop. Within Brisbane, where do you stop? You know, the shopping centers are getting built up, yet you still have to comply with the law. So it's trying to think ahead and, and know in your head where you're going to stop and then to find another carrier stop there already because he's got the same thing in mind as you do. So what do you do? You know, you can't break the law. So um, um, it, it's just compounded stress upon stress upon stress and no relief. Um, but I must say that our management team has done an excellent job in creating at least a year to listen and um, to hear the drivers. And sometimes, even if you don't have a solution, if the drivers just feel valued and listened to, it's you're already halfway there. Thanks, Paul. And God, I didn't even think about the fact that, you know, with all of the shutdowns, finding somewhere to eat and stop, you, you, you don't even think about those sort of logistical issues. Okay. Ross, your research looked at this. Is anything that came out of your research um, in terms of um, what what might have helped with those with those types of personal stresses? Um, I, I mean, I think yeah, I think it was touched on um, beautifully there that um, and and a lot of a lot of those stresses are, that drivers told us about they're hidden they're hidden from um, from the public um, and so the public don't recognise what it what it is that drivers have to do um, and and drivers told us that um, they're often they're put in that situation where they have to make a choice between well you know I can either um, I either have to break the law to do what I need to do, or I can take a rest where I have to break the law because I can't park the truck there. And so they're, they're constantly put into um, a, an impossible situation. And I mean, I think one of the one of the the benefits, if you like, is uh, of, of this situation is that a lot of these things, are, are, um, you know, are, are becoming more known for um, for the general public to to some extent. But what what's hitting me is that you know we can we can 
I'm not from the industry and I'm doing research in the industry and we're, we're really just scratching the surface and, and the and um, you know Matt and um, Scott and um, uh, and Paul have all described the you know the, the depth that that these issues run to the, the research just says well this is the impact this is having on their health but you really need to understand all of these issues if you um, and, and get um, uh, you get a real understanding from people in the industry to work out what what are the the possible solutions, and there are some great examples of of, of what's being done to support drivers through all all of those difficulties, um, and and we've had some example we've had the the talks today, so it's it's really about you know working together to to help um, help to spread those solutions so they're effective in 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 everywhere that they're needed. Thanks, Ross. Look, and, and I think you touched on as well, like, you know, there, there have been the challenges and there's a lot that, that that has been done by the industry to try and address those. So I'd ask you now to think about some of the positives that you might have noticed coming from those recent challenges, change, and disruption, and if we focus on sort of learnings that, that, that may end up as positives for the industry. And, and I might start with Scott. Uh, yeah, look, I think one of the things is we may have only been through two and a half years, but from a technical, technical, technological point of view, our drivers um, and managers have been through a decade. Um, we now have uh, apps on our phone, uh, CASCOM apps, so we can message drivers, we can have that information on their phones instantaneously. So, yeah, we still have toolbox talks, but we can actually push the information. We can get information back. Simon talked about the survey monkey. You know, three years ago, that was all wildly new and we had to sort of educate people. Now, most of our team adopt technology, things like Teams. Um, you know, I look after, looked after seven different branches across Victoria and South Australia. I'd be traveling every week, but I would probably have better relationships with my branch managers and some of the drivers through Teams now, because at least we talk much more frequently. They'll Teams me up and have a discussion. Uh, and likewise, we can work on the same documents. So rather than back and forwards and emails and phone calls and we're trying to make this change or we're trying to do something with this, we can just work on a document as a team. So some of that technology stuff, really good. And I'll just echo the other point, that little bit of respect for being an essential worker, um, you know, that's still uh, something that a lot of people around here feel proud uh, about. Matt, I might throw to you and see from um, DHL perspective what sort of positives you may have noticed arising from the change in your industry, in your organisation? Yeah, Bev, pretty much echoing what, what Scott was just discussing is is the use of technology um, across the business. Um, since I've been here, when I started with DHL, I found the, the company to be a bit technical, technologically backward and, and not embrace the use of te technology as much as I think they should have. But during the pandemic, I really think, um, uh, like what Scott was saying through the use of Teams very specifically, is that now um, we ha we're having these meetings more constantly. We used to save them to, to meet in person because obviously um, some employees would come from interstate. But now we've, we've found that um, we just use the Teams app to, to have um, everybody from across the country in on the one meeting. And that was that was unheard of um, prior to the to the pandemic. So I think one of the biggest positives, um, if you can, you know, that can come out of uh, the pandemic or, or this last three years, is um, is my company's embrace of technology and and they they're continuing to look at other avenues to to further digitalise. I guess you'd say. Thanks, Matt. And Ross, I might ask you in terms of your research. Um, if, if your research showed any sort of positives that might have come out of the last the last three years? Well, my, most of our research, like I said, we, we did during the, um, we actually captured the information before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, what we did find more, more recently was when we um, went to the managers of drivers and we actually um, found out, well, our training program designed for them, we actually found that the the level of awareness of the, of managers' impact on drivers' health is actually really quite high, and that's something that I believe would have you know increased you know throughout the pandemic. We've had some great examples of you know um, uh, initiatives to make sure the drivers feel supported, 
Um, we found there is still some work to do in some areas um, because I think there's the traditional areas that, that people think they can't impact and um, some of those might be, for example, um, uh, what, uh, driver weight and diet that people are less aware they can actually have a positive influence on those on those factors. But that, that, that awareness, I think, has definitely increased as a, as a result of the pandemic. And, and that means that it's ready to move into initiatives to actually you know, deliver on improving some of those factors that can, that can help driver's health. You know, and it can be as simple as being an ear, as was, as was mentioned before, um, that a lot of the solutions don't have to be, you know, uh, it's great to have the, the technology. Um, it, it opens the avenues for more ways to, to intervene. But but often that intervention it actually comes down to something being quite simple, which is actually giving someone a chance to talk through the, the issue that they're having, even if you don't have a solution. Thanks, Ross. And, and I'd imagine um, just in terms of the heightened awareness and the importance of the industry and, and the, you know, the importance that frontline workers have played, um, there must, that sense of pride and in, in the work that they do, I, I imagine that's a positive that's come out in terms of the awareness of the community. Okay, so what I what we might do now is we, we've spoken sort of broadly, but I'd be interested in the in in sort of the initiatives that that have been introduced um, at in the organisations to support the workers or workforce. And so Paul, I might throw to you in terms of what was done um, in your industry to in, any initiatives put in place to support sort of the drivers and the workers um, during this time? There's one of the best um, um, initiatives that I see that really works is um, <clears throat> our project manager was at 2 a.m. every morning and he put the barbie on for everyone. Now that's a lot of drivers, 160 plus. So um, just to have a barbie on where people can, for 15 minutes before the shift starts, they've got food in their stomach, so they're already happy being a driver. Um, but, you know, just the manager talking to them, find out what's important for them in their lives, their hobbies, and ask questions. And it just gave the drivers the ability to release some steam and winch if they need winching. And the, the poor manager was very accommodating you know and and just listening and um it's also a good way of marking when someone is really going through trouble because like are you okay day um it's a very formal thing and drivers wouldn't necessarily come forward and say oh yeah i've got a problem but if you just more relax around a barbecue and you speak to your boss and your mates and um it also builds that relationship between management and and the workers so um it did that that uh I'd say the biggest effect in our yard, it, it works really well. Right. And is that still in play today? Um, I mean, that's just a really great, simple initiative. Um, yes, it is still in place today, although not daily, though. Um, yeah. Now we do it once a month and um, um, we actually had a barbecue yesterday morning or the day before. So um, for that um, um, safe uh, heads in sheds and trucks and um, it, it, it's very good yeah no um, so it's ongoing pro, uh, program that I don't think will stop soon it's too po it's too positive. Thanks Paul and Matt in terms of DHL in terms of your role as a work health and safety across the organisation uh, initiatives that DHL might have put in place to support your workers? Yeah, so I think one of the best ones and one that I'm really proud of my of DHL for doing was um, paid entitlements um, for when our employees had to go off uh, and isolate. So it's hard to think when you look at the current situation now that, but you know, back middle of last year, if if you were at a shopping centre at a certain or a shop at a certain time and place, you were required to isolate for for 14 days or seven days, depending on on what the government was saying. So. A lot of our employees um, coming from the Western Sydney area, um, and I use Sydney because I'm based in Sydney, but we, we had similar situations across the country, but a lot of our employees were considered getting classes, casual, close contacts, and having to do the mandatory isolation so they couldn't come to work. Now, this was started, you know, a lot of our employees, some of them don't have enough leave saved. So there was that added pressure now where I can't go to work because um, I'm, I'm mandatorily, I'm legally required to isolate. 
an hour won't get paid. So what we did was if, if any employee was required to isolate because they were a casual or close contact or a positive, um, they were paid um, for their full working for the, for the full time of hour off without having to use any entitlements. And I really think um, that initiative um, assisted in terms of, of mental well-being. So they, they knew that they were they were um, the income was still coming in. There wasn't that pressure of the, the, the money's drying up kind of thing. So I think that was an excellent initiative that the company introduced and, and kept um, our employees um, content that, uh, you know, there were going to be no changes to their to their incomes. Um, and one more thing they did, which I thought was really, really nice, and, and thanks to the um, to the minister, but the federal health minister, Greg Hunt, just attended um, our one of our sites in Western Sydney where the vaccine rollouts were happening. And personally met a lot of our workers this is towards the end when when things started to open up again and personally met the workers and thanked them and and i could just tell that it was a, it was a good um it was a good boost of, of morale on us on the site and it was good to have that recognition of our workers um you know for the hard work that they'd done throughout the the pandemic Thanks, Matt. Look, we might move on to our last question, my last question now. So we've reflected today on some of the challenges and the impacts and the opportunities and positive outcomes. We also spoke about what initiatives have worked in the workplace. So as we move forward, what do you see as those challenges that the industry will face? Are they much of the same or, or are there emerging issues that, that you can see coming? I mean, we didn't expect COVID, so is there, is there another unexpected thing coming? So I might throw to Paul to start off with. Do you see any sort of emerging issues coming in, in, in the future? I do. Um, I think um, traffic is one major the more the cities gets built up the more stressful it gets the harder it is getting into places that you used to get into the less space there is to rest um, and i think we need to build on the resilience of transport we need to have resilient drivers that can handle whatever gets thrown their way and the number one thing to do that is to work safety up rather than down we can't we can't decide for the workers what is safe for them. They're the ones doing the job. they the professionals in their field. We need to listen more, and they would be very quick to tell you what they need to do their job properly. So I think we need to swap it around a bit and um, listen to the drivers and then find solutions for their problems. I think when we do that, um, we can handle anything in the transport industry. Thanks, Paul. And I, I think we saw that reflected in terms of, you know, the feedback in relation to consultation and the safety two responses. So, so thanks for that. Um, in terms of uh, at an operational level, um, Scott, um, you know, you, you've both had the operational hat on and you've now got the national HSC hat on. What do you see, see the challenges? Look, I might start at a very high level. I, I do think COVID and, and what has happened, um, both internationally and domestically, has shifted the way logistics and transport work in Australia. Um, I've got no doubt that we have moved away from just in time to more of a just in case. And that's for a lot of different parts of the Australian manufacturing and business world. So with that, we've also then seen ordering for material from overseas uh, increase. Um, and we've also seen a rationalisation that's been around shipments and, and ships, but also container availability. So what we're actually seeing is probably more material being ordered, more volume, more transport. Um, it was great in the first uh, 18 months when we had lockdowns and no cars on the road. We could move everything around and achieve everything really well. But the last six, eight months with everyone back, everything there, the traffic, everything Paul, Paul has talked about is a challenge. And I think the next 12 months, we are gonna keep seeing uh, the import shipments into Australia being very peaky. So rather than many ships over a longer period of time and the ability to work as a transport company to move things around slowly, we're getting one ship that's come from Singapore that's got every Australian box on it. And so we've got three days, four days to clear 500 boxes um, across all of our different customer orders at once. And it's that intensity that the next 12 months for me, I think is, is how do we handle that intensity? Because it goes to Paul's point, you know, we've only got so many hours for our drivers to do, we've only got so many vehicles, um, we can only turn them around um, within certain time periods. So how does Australia respond to that kind of peaky volume that we're probably going to see in the next 12 months? 
Yeah, again, something as a consumer, you you just don't think about. I, I mean, you're aware of it, I think, during Christmas time and when, when there's those pegs, but you, you, you know, with these new supply issues, it's certainly, um, you, you don't think about those types of challenges. Um, Ross, I might turn to you in terms of just uh, what, what your research might have indicated, you know, these challenges into the future. My my main concern of the challenges into the future is around what what are the what are the health impacts of this period where you know, people have been operating at, at a much higher level um, and it's been sustained for a long time uh, and and what that what that means for for the people in the industry and what that means for um, uh, uh, sustaining the industry in terms of where where are the where are the younger drivers coming from that are going to um, you know, enter, enter the industry and, and keep it keep it running and keep driving the trucks, um, because the health impacts that we've seen and, and and in my presentation I talked about how much it's going to cost. It's going to cost billions of dollars in lost productivity if we don't improve health, and that was before the the pandemic um, uh, increasing things and. The pandemic has, has has spread that stress <laughs> across other people. There's a great comment in the chat about who's who's looking after the managers, you know, who whose stress levels have gone, you know, have, have increased as well for all the reasons that, that we've that we've talked about. So for me, that that concern is that um, we need to make sure the health of everyone in the industry is is front and centre, um, because if we don't have healthy people um, performing the roles, then Nothing's going to get done. You're not going to be able to clear. Um, you're not going to be able to clear those boxes, whether it's um, whether it's smooth or peaky. Or um, you, you need people operating effectively and being happy at work and being appreciated at work, but then having the opportunity to get their health seen to when they need to. Yeah, and I think that's a, a great way to to end it. You know, it's it's really about people and 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 supporting them so they, you know can can support us. So look, I'd like to to thank the panel. Um, you've heard throughout the forum and the panel today that there are some significant challenges and opportunities that have been raised. The panel have been very candid in their experiences and discussion today. So look, I'd really like to thank you for that. Um, we have a diverse range of people at this forum. We ask you to reflect on the discussions today and how these might relate in the context of the work and the broader industry. We also ask you to reflect how these could inform actions and strategies that you could develop to support your workers now, but also into the future. So again, I thank you very much. It's been, I found it really valuable. I've actually learnt quite a bit about the transport industry today and some of those challenges that I, I wasn't even aware of, and it's given me some new insights into to, to what you went through over the last three years. So thank you. Um, I'll hand back over to you now, Tom. Thanks, Bev, and uh, thanks, gentlemen. Um, excellent uh, panel discussion. Um, and thank you also to everyone who presented uh, and attended today. It's really been a great event. A final reminder, if you'd like to stay in touch with the work Comcare is doing, including any events, guidance and resources, be sure to subscribe now to our Comcare e-news or follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. The links are in the chat now. Finally, thank you again for joining us. Have a great day and stay safe.